Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is the uh, Apostate Prophet. I hope you're having a fantastic day or even or night or whatever it is that you have. Uh, we are a little bit late. That's because uh, they had a problem. He was uh, held up by an act of God. And uh, there, was a, there, was, there was the issue here. But uh, here we are. No problems at all. Um, I... I was just zoning out, and I was just waiting for the intro to finish. I, I totally forgot that we are uh, having a live stream right now. I was totally a blank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, I'm here with Jay tonight. Um, I would like, uh, if you want to introduce yourself to everybody, who are you? What do you believe in? Why are we here tonight? Uh, we can just go ahead with that, I guess. Yeah, um, so I, I cover... A lot of different things in my website. I do a lot of essays and videos that that uh, cover everything from movie symbolism, film symbolism. Um, I have two books on that. I did a TV show based on that book. Uh, I do a lot of philosophy, a lot of debates with uh, everybody from uh, atheists to Muslims to uh, Roman Catholics. And then um, I also have a Discord server where we do a lot of the same stuff in there. So that's pretty much most of my time is uh, just doing that kind of stuff. I also cover a lot of geopolitics. I host the fourth hour of um, the A L E X J O N E S show. Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> we have to we have to censor that here. Or... <laughs> well, you know, I don't want to get your channel in trouble, but okay, you know. okay yeah. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I do. Okay, fantastic. Uh, you are an Orthodox Christian. Right? Correct. Yeah, I, I've, I've been Orthodox for, well, I've been convinced of Orthodoxy for many years, but I was received about two years ago. Okay, okay, wonderful. So um, we're mainly here tonight because, um, as, as far as people know me, I am. Um, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. Uh, I don't talk about it very much. My whole uh, activism is mostly built on uh, doing different things, like criticizing Islam, which is my former religion, which I know a lot about. Uh, since I have a very diverse audience, uh, people who are, uh, you know, of, of all kinds of different beliefs and many Christians, I am often asked about my belief in God. And it is something that I have for... Uh, quite a long time like for i don't know for, for a very long time actually I, I've, I've thought about it for forever i have just never really publicly talked about it and uh, people have been recommending you as somebody to talk to in this regard about why i don't believe in god why you believe in god and just to have a friendly discussion about this so that is the intention here the intention is not to have a have a debate and to get and crush and destroy each other but rather to have a to have a serious genuine exchange on um on, on, on why on why we should or should not believe in God. So uh, that's where I would like to, um, to to go with this. Now, since it, since this is just a since it's such a free talk, such a free conversation, I haven't really planned ahead on how to start this. But I guess it would be interesting to find out uh, what makes you um, believe or what has changed your mind in those last two years, for example. Well, I was raised Baptist. Uh, I didn't really take it seriously. My, my family was kind of halfway serious about it. Um, by the time I was about 18, uh, I got a little more serious, started reading the Bible back then. And then I kind of got into uh, church history, the history of the church, theology, how the Bible came to be, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of my 20s was wrapped up in those questions. I looked at a lot of uh, atheist arguments, apologetics, philosophy. So then my undergraduate degree was in philosophy, and then I went on to do uh, graduate studies in uh, analytical, continental type stuff, and uh, mainly got into orthodoxy around age 30, so that was about 10 years ago, and started reading a lot of the Eastern Church Fathers. I uh, read other religions too, looked at perennialism, looked at Platonism, Neoplatonism, and all that kind of stuff, different schools of, of thought. And um, a lot of different motivations and um, reasons, I guess I could give for why I still believe in God or believe the Orthodox view. Um, the two that come to mind would be on a personal level. Uh, I believe that God has been active in my life and has helped me in many ways and has answered prayers and those kinds of things. Uh, those definitely wouldn't be the arguments that I would bring to a debate because they're not very convincing. But to an individual, those kinds of things can be uh, assuring and convincing. Uh, on the objective philosophical level, uh, 
Um, I would look at things like what I call the, or what's called the transcendental argument. So that's typically the type of uh, theistic argumentation and school of philosophy that I uh, ascribe to. And I usually tie it into what's called divine conceptualism, uh, which is a form of theistic argumentation and analysis that looks at abstract objects and entities um, and shows how they have to be grounded in a certain way in a certain divine mind. Um, and then uh, on another sort of, if you wanted a kind of a building on tacking onto that, I also look at argumentation from like messianic prophecies and these kinds of things, which uh, have actually been pretty strong in arguing against Muslims. I know that's well, not what we're here to talk about tonight, but um, I do think that they are good uh, um, sort of attestations to the truthfulness of Christianity. If Christianity is true, we would expect to see things like um, you know, prophetic things that do objectively come true that we can go verify. So uh, basically the transcendental argument and then, uh, you know, the, the reliability of, of prophetic uh, predictions, I think, are the strongest claims for Christianity. I see. Um, I've always thought uh, you, you mentioned something about about your personal reasons uh, earlier, and how those are not strong arguments to bring in a, uh, in, a in a discussion or a debate. It's it's funny. I've um, I've always thought uh, over the the years when I see discussions about um, when I see debates that are centered around uh, scientific arguments for or against God, I kind of see that as a as a giant waste of time. I feel like <laughs> I agree. I feel, <laughs> yeah, I, agree. I feel like there is no point in arguing uh, arguing all, all the scientific dimensions of the matter at all. It doesn't prove anything. You you don't get anywhere with it. Whereas I feel like um, discussing personal experience is uh, to a person probably the strongest argument to believe in God. Whereas in a public debate, it is uh, probably the weakest argument for God. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Another thing too is that the kind of the school of philosophy that I would come from uh, believes in and looks at things according to paradigms or presuppositions. So I think that we all have a governing network of beliefs by which and through which we interpret the world. So if we come to the data, like scientific data, it's impossible to divest ourselves of presuppositions and assumptions. Uh, mm -hmm. We're all going to have rose colored glasses. And so that being the case, I think it's a much more sound argument, a stronger argument to look at these types of issues in the realm of the domain of philosophy, which is kind of in a way prior to uh, empirical scientific investigation, because science is undergirded by um, philosophy, whether the scientist knows that or not. Uh, now I, I have this. I have this issue. Um, when I look at arguments for or against God, I have this. Um, there's this one problem where I uh, would raise a, um, a a logical inconsistency of the whole concept of God. That is actually one of the one of the main uh, issues that I would uh, that I usually think about when it comes to the question of God. It is kind of uh, similar to the to the to the problem of evil, which many people think is uh, a big uh, um, a strong argument against God. I usually don't think that. The traditional uh, problem of evil is necessarily on its own a very strong argument against against the existence of God, but rather if you uh, extend it further into, um, for example, how um, you know how, how it makes sense that uh, that God created evil, created humans, created humans uh, ab as as beings that are able to be evil, created evil. Uh, created a place where they would eventually go to be punished uh, when he could have simply just created a place where evil doesn't exist because evidently it is possible because that is the eventual uh, eternal abode as far as uh, Christianity tells it. And uh, God's uh, omnipotence and uh, the fact that he is all-knowing also requires that uh, beforehand, before God created everything, before God created uh us before he created good and evil before evil came forth however you want to see it i guess with christianity you would say that uh i, I don't know how, how how that is with with orthodox christianity but i usually get the objection very much from protestants for example that god did not create evil but that god but that evil uh, emerged from the uh, from the rebellion or acts of satan for example but uh nonetheless evil was created evil was part of this whole plan and uh 
God must have known at the very beginning how uh, how we would have you know, how, what kind of what kinds of choices we would make, how we would design our free will, what we would uh, do with our free will. He would know that eventually we would end up in in evil and eternal torture, but nevertheless, he created us. Uh, is uh, that that in summary, we could go into that very uh, very very deeply if if you wish. Is I think one of the major reasons why I have always had an issue with. Uh, the belief in God, the monotheistic or the Islamic or Christian God, uh, in and of itself. And so it's I don't even get to to, to the point of arguing uh, prophecies, for example, or or arguing um, Christian scripture or Islamic scripture, because the whole my whole my whole problem is that I am just stuck at logically making sense of God and free will and evil. And if that doesn't make sense, if there is one big major logical flaw, and if that flaw, if that if that gap cannot be filled, if that cannot be explained, then how could I simply ignore that and move ahead and, uh, and look at prophecies, for example? You know, that's... Uh, yeah. Right. Well, there's quite a few issues that are that you brought up there. Uh, Several of those would, yes, would require. Sorry, I was just. I was just <laughs> it's okay. I mean, it's there's there's areas where I would add quite a bit of nuance, but mm -hmm. for one, I would say that the the operating assumption here is that we have a notion of good and evil, uh, some sort of value judgment standard by which we're going to say that God, in this case, is irrational or inconsistent or immoral. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to then. Uh, subject God to that standard that we kind of already assume is fair or unfair. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the difference with the argument that I would make is that at a paradigm level, we don't really have the ability to, from the outset, decide what we think is fair or unfair. Because if you read like the book of Job, for example, where this issue comes up, God's response to this very question is, well, if you're finite, then by necessity, you're not going to be able to understand, for example, all of the different infinite uh, interrelations between, you know, ob uh, uh, beings who are making uh, free will decisions. So you're not able to know what the big scope picture is because you lack omniscience, for example. The other thing I would say is that God isn't under any obligation to reveal to us why he does that. So we may not like that, but within the Christian paradigm, it's not inconsistent that God does not tell us in every instance why he allows X, Y, Z to happen. The other thing I would say is that this is not really a problem that any worldview can adequately resolve. So, so this is kind of a, a problem that everybody's stuck in. It doesn't really matter if you could choose a different paradigm, but you're not really going to get a different answer to this question because this, this, question deals with things at a kind of meta omniscience level. And since all of us are finite, we don't really have access to that. Nobody's really going to have a, just by virtue of finitude, human finitude, going to have um, a, an exhaustive kind of answer to this question. So at the outset, I would say that objection kind of asks for the impossible uh, mm -hmm. for any worldview, because even most of the time, I don't think there's any objector who who themselves could answer that question, right? Because let's say you don't have the, the theistic paradigm, you have a naturalistic paradigm, you still have these kind of unresolved meta level questions within within that paradigm. So um, I just think that's a feature of all worldviews. Uh, what is the ultimate answer between why there's good, why there's evil, free will, etc.? We'll never have that answer in this life. Uh, I don't think that it works as a significant criticism of Christianity because it assumes a kind of moral benchmark standard by which to judge God, which I would need to know from the atheist or the skeptic uh, on what basis they have that moral benchmark or objective standard to make that judgment call. Uh, and then lastly, I would say that there's also a distinction between evil as a privation uh, in our view and what we are calling evil. So for example, we don't say that evil is a thing. It's not a substance that doesn't have ontological reality. It's a privation. So for us, evil is really only located in the move of the will away from the good. Uh, there's a good uh, essay by one of the church fathers, Ath St. Athanasius, it's called uh, Against the Heathen. And he, he takes up this point, he takes up this argument and he talks about how we don't really conceive of evil as a, a substantial creation that God like gave it being or substance. Even when it comes to uh, Satan himself, we don't believe that Satan has in his own nature, anything evil. It's rather that his will is perpetually turned towards uh, 
going against God, you could say. So even his will, even his nature, the, the fallen angels are not inherently evil. So nothing is inherently evil. And that would lead to kind of a Manichaean dualistic position if we were to affir affirm that. So I would argue rather that really only the paradigm where we're made in the image of God and we have the ability as individ individual uh, sort of sentient beings with, with reason, with the faculty of willing, do we have a a basis to even talk about good and evil? I would say that is my reverse argument that we at least have within our paradigm the means and the modes by which we can judge good and evil actions, virtue and vice, how we can have you know social standards and whatnot for society, uh, a civic law, penal sanctions, etc. Uh, and rather uh, on the uh, atheist paradigm, there's not really a coherent basis as to how we can have those objective standards. Really all you can appeal to, as far as I understand, from the atheists that I've dealt with and, and argued with for many years, is just kind of a social construct view, right? Well, we all agree to this and, uh, you know, this is kind of what makes things nice or better, or this is, you know, quote, beneficial, but that's all kind of begging the question. I mean, how do we know what's quote beneficial? I mean, for example, is it beneficial to kill off, uh, you know, everybody under 120 IQ? Or not? I mean, people. I'm not trying to say that you believe that. I'm just saying that no, there's a lot of there's a lot of difficult questions that you could raise. That just saying something like a slogan, like, "Well, we just do what." Jake, give you a good answer. Um, so you, you just you just throw. <laughs> I was just saying that that usually that utilitarian answer doesn't, in my view, um, go very far when you have kind of like difficult questions like. You know, do we reduce mm -hmm. the population or, you know, this kind of stuff? Well, um, I have quite a few things to say about that. Um, I don't know. I want to start at, at, at the whole uh, question of existentialism, of uh, existential uh, angst. Um, and when you... Um, I, I would just like to like to go back to uh, you are born... You, or, you, or you come into this into this world as a human. You don't know anything at all. You have uh, tribes around you. You have uh, people around you who are all after the same thing. They seemingly all want to um, want to survive. They want comfort. They want uh, warmth. They want food. They want food. They want uh, they want happiness. Happiness they find if they uh, experience life by uh, giving each other comfort, by having comfort, by helping each other out. If they cannot help each other out because they don't have the means, they uh, end up oftentimes uh, taking from each other, getting mad at each other, and killing each other. These are uh, I mean merely simply um, you know things that are things that are uh, that are called good and bad based on their functionality i like to think when i think of morality i like to think about the the mongols you know the mongols were uh, a very problematic group of people in uh, around the time of uh, a thousand years ago um, at the beginning of the, of the of the of the previous millennium and um when the Mongols were going around, the Mongols didn't have any morals to hold on to. All they had was that uh, they were um, tribes that were distributed among the, the the East Asian, Northeast Asian steppes where land was uh, terrible. It was scarce. There was nothing to do. There was nothing to plant. There was... Uh, they didn't really have much the uh, the option to to live together and to survive together and to flourish, which is why all they knew was to fight each other and to take from each other, uh, which is what they did for most of the time. They fought each other, they killed each other, they uh, they became extremely tribalistic, aggressively tribalistic, built superiority uh, onto each other. Then. Uh, certain individuals came and uh, provided unity among these Mongols. And what they did was to open up into the rest of the world and to attack those lands where people don't live as desperately as the Mongols live in the, st in the steppes. And what they did on that path in order to simply live better was to, to, to invade all kinds of lands, invade all the lands that they encountered. And they didn't care at all about any morals. They didn't care about, uh, about being good and bad. They spread fear and they conquered by, uh, by, 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 by slaughtering young and old, male and female, sexually violating people, placing them onto, you know, at, at the, uh, onto the, you know, the, uh, on, on gates to just make people afraid and to just say, "Hey, we are here. We will take your land, no matter what. Now get out." And that is how that is how they lived. That was their morality for a while. 
then these people settled into the regions that they conquered and they started living uh, as proper societies, as civilized societies, and started adapting into uh, their environments and started developing uh, more functional kinds of moralities. And then the moral more moralities that they developed and, they, and that they adopted were merely based on a set on, on on how things function, on what people want, on what works. There was not a divine logic behind it. What was behind it was, hey, uh, if I live here now, and if I like to uh, to eat when I'm hungry and to have some warmth when it's cold, or to you know to cool myself off when it's when it's when it's too hot. If I like to raise my children, if I like to 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 be given things, then I should make sure that we don't kill each other, that uh, that we outlaw killing, so that so that you don't just come and kill me, and you don't just uh, come and take my belongings. We should make rules. We should establish these rules, and people establish these rules merely based on functional functionality merely based on the fact that people simply want to desire this, that this is logical, this is how society functions, this is how it works. If you don't make these rules, people slaughter each other, people kill each other, people take from each other, and there is no happiness beyond this. So uh, morality in that sense is it's quite uh, logical rather than requiring um, any deeper meaning. But uh, when it then comes to judging God, and uh, God's intentions, God's plans for us in uh, creating us and eventually condemning us to eternal hellfire, I would rather judge God not based on this, which is hard to do, but rather based on uh, the morality of Christianity itself, the morality which Christianity teaches us. For example, when the Christian God teaches us that we should uh, forgive each other, that uh, when, when Jesus says, uh, forgive them, Father, for they do not know, and we learn to forgive people for their gravest mistakes, but then you see that God uh, condemns sensitive beings to eternal hellfire. This doesn't look cruel to me. It simply looks illogical and inconsistent to me. We can go much further into that, but uh, the basis of that was just the gist right. of that was just that. Yeah. So a couple of things that come to mind here is um, <clears throat> so when you talk about the the analogy that you made to the Mongols and then how they didn't have morals, um, that they were sort of pragmatic. They do they did these actions that basically served the tribe or the leaders of the tribe, and then they kind of settled into the lands that they'd conquered and then they kind of got civilized and they, they erect laws on the basis of what works and that this is uh, therefore pragmatic. And you seem to say that what was pragmatic was therefore logical. I assume you mean to them that they saw that as logical, yeah, yeah. but what, what so, works basically. Yeah. Right. But there's a problem in philosophy with equating um, what is quote logical merely with what works because it's sort of self-referential. So there's nothing about something that works and because it happens that allows you to identify that with a, an ethical norm that's objective and hume for example uh, illustrated this when he talked about how you can't get an ought from an is so the fact that something is the case really can never tell you that it ought to be the case and therefore sure. give you some sort of ethical binding logical uh, uh norm that you need to uh, to, to uh, submit to and likewise i can make that same argument for logic itself the mere fact that people do something and that something quote works does not equate to uh that being identical to or uh, uh a justification for it being logical itself so this is two different domains like i might be able to um, rip people off for a long time with uh faulty say math figurings that i'm doing with my uh, algorithms or something like this or or, or I'm, I'm doing some checkbook manipulation or I'm keeping two different books or something like this and I'm or maybe I'm ripping off a business and it works but because it works that doesn't mean that that corresponds therefore to correct mathematical principles or abstract logic you see mm -hmm. so that's the the point that Hume is making for ethics is the same for your analogy and it's the same for the uh, comparison to logic itself so I, I don't think you can make the move to equate quote, what works with logic itself. That's a higher order question. So abstract objects, abstract entities can never be identified with physical states or physical mm -hmm. phenomena. It's impossible. It's very easy to show that that's not the case. And so therefore, that's my immediate response to this. And on, on your question of, of God, 
um, in terms of his paradigm for giving, I would say, yes, if, if God exists, then we have to judge God and his standard by the holistic revelation that he's given. And so, for example, forgiveness is not unconditional. Even for humans, it's not unconditional. Jesus says that you forgive your brother if he, if he repents, if he asks for forgiveness. It's not incumbent upon me to, uh, like, for example, just be a doormat and let, oh, I have to let you uh, rape my wife because Jesus said, turn the other cheek and uh, I have to forgive you. No, no, that's not at all. I mean, there's, there's a holistic context to Revelation that includes the principle, for example, of self-defense, as well as Jesus' principles that, that relate to what to do in situations where you may not have the ability to defend yourself. I mean, if the government sends a whole team of people to take me, you know, into custody or something like that, I guess it's not going to be beneficial or it's pointless for me to resist. Right. So I'm not going to grab my machine gun and try to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger and like, you know, fend them all off in that situation. Right. Based on the totality of revelation, I would do the principle of what Solomon talks about, that there's a time for war. There's a time for peace. There's a time to fight. There's a time to become a martyr in that situation. There's no point in fighting. So it would be wiser to try to, uh, you know, just give in and, and give up. But in other situations, we do have the the just uh, principles behind when we should wage war, when we should uh, engage in self-defense. And also, likewise, even God himself does not make forgiveness completely conditional, uh, excuse me, unconditional. There there are principles uh, relating to repentance and changing mm-hmm. your ways. Mm-hmm. Well, um, it, it is true. Uh what you said earlier, just because something uh, seems to work well, that doesn't mean this is what we should abide by. You cannot just uh, simply uh, make something a normative rule. You cannot just form normative morality based on what uh, seemingly uh, works in one society or in one environment or one time. Uh, that is true, but um, it is more and more becoming a real reality, which is what uh, the laws of our time, which we form in our time, for example, are largely based on. They're based on what people figure out should happen, what people figure out should be the case, what people figure out, uh, you know, should be sh- what, what we should do, what we should allow and disallow, are, are largely based on uh, what people actually desire, what they desire for themselves, or what they desire for others. But um, in fact, I, I didn't earlier make the connection between. Um, between how I can judge God based on a uh, on a on a moral understanding um, as as an atheist, uh, but um, there is there are several issues that I want to that I want to go into here, which is uh, I want to keep the thought of uh, murder in mind. I would love to go with you into the discussion on why murder is wrong and why Christianity forbids murder, for example. Uh, and 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 there, if we if we talk about murder, we can see that murder is simply wrong because it is simply dysfunctional. It is simply idiotic of people to murder each other. It is simply it simply doesn't make sense. It doesn't serve the greater purpose of of humans to murder each other. When a Christian uh, tries to explain why a society in which God doesn't exist would be wrong because people would uh, just, uh, you know, murder each other because, they'd have, because they would have no reason to abstain from murder, then, then they would also have to explain why murdering each other is wrong to begin with. And the only reason, the only possible explanations that they could give to that would be that murder is dysfunctional, murder is bad for a society, it is it's, it's debilitating. It causes humans to uh, be unhappy, to be, uh, to be unproductive, to not, to seemingly not serve their ultimate meaning, their ultimate desires in life. Um, now, with with, with Christianity, uh, Christianity also teaches us that, uh, that that killing each other is wrong. It gives us these these basic morals. Uh, I'm 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 currently jumping uh, totally away from that. Just just. Uh, <laughs> We can go into that separately, but uh, if if we want to uh, judge God and His act of uh, not forgiving us for disbelieving, I think um, we don't really need a basis on which we can judge ju- judge whether God is wrong in uh, f- in uh, in not forgiving us for disbelieving. I think we can simply judge God uh, in very simple ways. I mean, just look at you and me. I assume you were born in. Uh, America, right? 
I was born in, in Germany into a Turkish Muslim family. It was uh, very likely for me to be born as a Muslim, to live my life as a Muslim. Maybe I was uh, I, ha I had interactions with Christianity. I could have maybe at some point converted to Christianity, but it was extremely unlikely. Statistically seen, it was very likely for me to just keep existing as a Muslim and to eventually die as a Muslim. I was uh, one of very few, and I eventually changed my religion. I became uh, an atheist. For you, it was uh, it is statistically very likely to be born as a Christian, to live as a Christian, and to die as a Christian, maybe more likely than for me to become an atheist at some point, and extremely unlikely to become an, to become a non-Muslim at some point. Now, uh, God puts us into this world, according to the Christian narrative and the Muslim narrative. God puts us into this world, sends us a book, or, or, or uh, sorry, that was kind of, a, that was kind of uh, Islamic language there, uh, reveals or inspires certain books that are supposed to serve um, as guidance for us to find the ultimate meaning in life. Uh, but we are put into geographical limits in which we are bound to most likely never find that actual purpose. You are much more likely to die as a Christian while I am much more likely to die as a Muslim. Now, I seek for the true meaning in, in life, and I really want to become a Christian at some point. In fact, over the years, I really wanted to be a Christian because I really thought, hey, it would have, it would make my life easier. I would feel better about it. And I really looked for it, but I couldn't find it. After, after genuine seeking, it just didn't happen. I wasn't convinced. I was really not convinced by it. I tried my best. Now, um, this God that Christianity preaches uh, will judge me for my disbelief and will it eventually condemn me to hell as it seems as it is taught simply because i was unconvinced and i didn't believe in him whereas uh somebody else who was born into christianity and who has probably never ever questioned his or her beliefs will die as a christian and will eventually go to heaven after all whether it, whether that person was a good christian or a bad christian eventually that person goes to heaven and is uh, granted heaven by God. If you look at this, there is simply a, a an inconsistency which doesn't even require us to, to to have a moral basis to judge this whole matter. It is simply internally inconsistent of God to create this system and then judge us based on that. Well, there's a couple points that come to mind here that, first of all, uh, Orthodox theology is a little different than most branches of Western Christianity that you would encounter. So the tendency in the West after um, the prevalence of Augustinian theology and then uh, in, in the Protestant domain after the widespread acceptance of Augustinian theology by Luther and Calvin, you get this kind of very dim attitude when it comes to, for example, uh, all of the people who were born before the coming of Christ. So really, only orthodoxy has maintained what we call the doctrine of the harrowing of Hades. We actually believe that when Christ descended into Hades, when he died on the cross, he went down into the realm of the dead to preach the gospel. Uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria and other great orthodox theologians make it very uh, clear that that's because God didn't want to leave anyone out <laughs> of the possibility of, of hearing this message. And so even... Uh, pagans in the Old Testament who had died, uh, St. Cyril says, were able to hear this message. So we don't uh, make these sort of sweeping judgments that, um, well, sorry, too bad for you. You were born in China and you never heard about. Well, we don't really we don't typically make that assessment because we don't have the Augustinian um, obsession that the West has. And I say that as somebody who was very into Augustine for many years, I have most a large portion of his works up here. I spent most of my twenties reading him and um, uh, which is not to say that we don't have him as a, an important theologian in our church, but we don't give him the um, the precedent that the West tended to give him. And we think that that's kind of a, uh, of a, an excess that w wouldn't really make sense given the, the doctrine of God's mercy and love, which is what you're kind of hitting on. And I would also add, this is my opinion, but I mean, we don't typically judge. Paul says we don't make judgments about those who are outside of the church. It's not really our domain to do that. We can say that we know that it's our duty to try to bring them uh, to Christ and bring them to the church. But um, let's say somebody, let's say somebody grew up in, I don't know, a rural small town and their only experience with Christianity was like a crazy snake handling church in the middle of nowhere. 
uh, and they died. Uh, now, would we say that we know that that person is damned because they didn't believe in some ridiculous snake handling cult? I would not say so. I don't. I think that's kind of absurd. I don't know what happens in that case, but I do know that what we're told, for example, in the book of John, Jesus says that to whom much is given, much is required. And he's speaking of the principle of revelation. Uh, so if you've been given a lot of revelation, a lot more is going to be required of you. Paul says in Romans 2 that um, even those who do not have the the um, oracles of God, meaning the scriptures, he says they do have revelation in the sense of what we call natural law or moral law uh, or natural revelation would be maybe a better term. Um, so we don't have that kind of sweeping um, negative assessment. We don't claim to know. We kind of leave that up to God. But we know that God is fair. We know that God is just. We don't We don't think that uh, there's just this kind of like hopeless pattern of, of billions of people that were created just to be damned. I think that's kind of ridiculous. But you, but still the the, the concept. I'm hearing myself. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. It's better. Um, sorry, I was just totally thrown off by that. Uh, but still, you have the concept of. I mean, um, you have based on biblical teachings, based on the the, the New Testament, uh, which tells us that that those who are um, who don't have faith, those who don't believe, uh, will not be will not be saved or will be condemned i don't know correct me if i if, if i'm if i'm wrong but there are several references in the new testament on the fact that those who do not believe will be uh punished sure. for their disbelief those who don't yes, believe will, will go to hell yeah. will go to a place of suffering or right, but that's what i'm saying right to, to whom much is given much is required so the more that you have been exposed to what is true and what is correct the more accountable the more culpable you are uh, so I'm not saying that that automatically makes everyone say to we. I, I just I'm just saying that we're not told, and if if we're not told, then in our our perspective is to, uh, you know, leave that up to to God's judgment. So um, some of those questions we we just don't simply know. Like uh, what happens to infants that are that die outside of baptism? Saint Gregory of Nyssa, a famous Orthodox saint, wrote a, a big essay on that. And he basically just says we commend them to God. We don't know what exactly is you know God's plan in those cases, but we don't make the kind of sweeping assessment that, you know, like we just literally think God's creating, you know, billions of people to be damned. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's, that's different with Orthodox Christianity, as opposed to Western forms of Christianity is that you get a scholastic attempt to try to give a definitive answer to every single question. And we're happy in many cases with saying that there's questions that we're not told. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't have the answer to all those all those issues. And there's also another doctrine that is not in the West that we have. It's called the doctrine of the toll houses, which is the notion of there is a uh, journey of the soul after death. <clears throat> uh, there's a famous book by uh, Father Seraphim Rose, who's a, a pretty prominent modern Orthodox writer. And uh, he wrote a, a book about that. And he actually compares it in ways. I'm not trying to, I don't want to overstress the similarity, but he compares it to kind of the, um, journey of the soul in um, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. He says there's similarities between the two approaches. That doesn't mean that we're Tibetan Buddhists. I'm just saying that there is some truth in comparative religions. So other religions have this notion as well that there are uh, experiences, there's phenomena that occur even after death where a person can um, you know, come to have forgiveness in certain ways. That doesn't mean that I think that anyone is saved outside of Christ. No one can be saved outside of Christ, but in what ways God, you know, can um, reveal things to those uh, even after death? We're we're not told that either. Well, the thing is, um, I get your point. Um, I mean, uh, it, it is not for you to exactly um, to, ex to exactly uh, declare or, or 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 explain the details of who and who's who is forgiven and who is not. And there's a lot of uh, vagueness on that. You're not in, in a position to tell uh, by, by your beliefs. But in the end, it all, I mean, that doesn't really do much to the point. It only changes uh, the, the, the magnitude of the problem. But the point still stands. The problem still exists. And, uh, we still have the same problem, even if uh, people are judged based on their abilities or based on their based on their geographical regions based on their standards whatever whatever you want to say in the end people are still judged 
flawed people created by God in, a, in flawed ways are still judged and the, and the, and the, and the book uh, still promises for them reward or punishment. We are flawed beings. We make simple mistakes. In psychology, we learn that, uh, that, that humans can barely be held responsible for so many mistakes that we make throughout the day because so many of our mistakes depend on depend on uh, on, on, on very simple, on very simple, very small moments in our lives, on our environments, on our desires, and yet we are still at some point judged by not being convinced that God is real, that God exists, and God eventually uh, condemns us forever for that. I know, I get it. You're you're saying uh, we don't know the details of that. Uh, God may apply different standards to different people. There may be a different uh, form of forgiveness, a different uh, way that, th that 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 God tests some people, forgives other people, rewards other people. But in the end, the judgment still exists. It is still there, and nothing makes it disappear. It is right there in the Scripture. It is promised, and uh, it it's kind of seems illogical and unfair that God would actually uh, send such a vague message to humanity, uh, put them through a uh, test over thousands of years, and each one of us maybe on average 70 years, and then seriously make uh, such a brutal decision about our eternity. Uh, yeah, okay, I see, I see your objection now. Um, first thing I would say is that we would not say that it's vague. So there is a kind of um inner testimony that is evident to everyone that doesn't mean that i think everyone believes affirmatively the proposition that god exists but we believe that in the inner uh, domain of man's heart in his innermost being he does know deep down that there is one true god and that that god is revealed uh, even in nature this is the argumentation of saint paul in, in romans 1 and that's why we would say that there is such a thing as, as a universal moral law or natural revelation so to speak which is distinct from the bible or scripture but it's the same it's the same content namely that it's telling us that there is uh, a personal god but i would agree with you that we can't just look at nature and know that in the sense of like getting the right interpretation of god we still need to uh look in the higher domain of of, of more abstract concepts perhaps this kind of stuff to get us to understanding what type of god we're talking about but the mere fact that like all, you know, ancient civilizations, they had these inner sort of principles by which they would worship deities. I'm not saying this makes it true. I'm saying if I wanted to use the kind of pragmatic approach like you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. I mean, haven't all societies has some kind of, uh, you know, divinity, census divinitatis or sense of the, of the deity that they, that, that suggests that man's heart yearns for more. Again, I'm not saying that means that it's true, but I'm just saying that if we wanted to just survey societies, this, the mere fact that societies have that impetus, I think, suggests uh, that there is uh, a, a testament to God, even in the natural world. I mean, this is why so many ancient societies worship nature. They worshiped personifications of nature, powers in nature, you know, uh, animism, polytheism, henotheism, et cetera, all these different theisms, pantheism. They suggest, I think, that there is something to that. Uh, testimony even in the natural world but i don't think that that's sufficient and so we need divine revelation and this is where we get into you know the the text of scripture and the different books and whatnot um and that that arena i would say is not vague so i would take issue with the claim that um that it's vague i don't think divine revelation is vague i think it's very there might be areas of divine revelation that are difficult but vague is, is not the same thing as difficult. So I don't think that anybody is uh, without excuse. In fact, in fact, Paul says that uh, all men are without excuse. Well, the issue is uh, that I have with this is um, thanks for the for the explanation. By the way, uh, the issue that I have with this is um, th this is a very common argument to claim that uh, that we have it in us that we feel. It, that it is somewhere in there, the belief that, or, or, or the knowledge that God exists, that it is real. Uh, this is indeed something that I have um, heard quite often as a Muslim, because the Quran itself, for example, uh, mentions the same thing, that it was placed into our hearts and that we know that it is uh, that it is true that we know that God exists that He created us and that He made an agreement with us. Uh, the same concept exists in in, in Christianity uh, as, as well. Um, I don't know how far it exists, but 
um, th this is just an assertion. It's just a theory that is uh, merely based on something that humans try to understand. Uh, and okay, but remember, remember, I wasn't arguing that it's okay, true yeah. because of that. I was okay. just saying that if we were to survey, you know, ancient civilizations, I could give a, a the same t the way that you were looking at the Mongols and this kind of narrative of them, you know, conquering and settling and civilizing. I was, I mean, I could look at societies and say, well, they all worshipped, uh, you know, different types of deities. So there's some inner sense of, of deity. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I'm not I'm not making that argument per se, because I don't okay. think that that necessarily proves the position. It is an interesting uh, fact and an interesting um, approach to, you know, in comparative religion to look at all the different cultures that that operate that way. But I certainly totally agree with you that it's not a, a an argument that proves or disproves the fact that well, therefore, we have an inner sense of God. Um, no, I, I would argue that on the basis of what is the revealed theology. So you're correct. The scriptures do say that that man has in his innermost being this deep inner sense, which Orthodox theology calls the noose in OUS, which is a faculty we think that God gave us for knowing God directly. And the, we would say the reason that we don't perhaps in a day-to-day -day situation know God directly through the noose is precisely because of the fall of man. So we have to, within this paradigm or within Christianity, again, take into account the whole revelation. So the, the whole body of or deposit of revealed theology also has the doctrine of the fall. Uh, and so since man has fallen, and this is not really in Islamic theology, I'm not an expert on Islam. I've only been studying it for a year. But as far as I'm aware, it's not, you know, it's obviously a lot different in, in uh, Christianity. Yeah, being and so, fallen and original sin is not part of it's not part right, of it. right. And even Orthodox theology, their conception of original sin again is not exactly the same as the Augustinian Western mm -hmm. position. Um, but what we do, for example, Augustine doesn't believe in the noose, but we do think that that man's innermost being is damaged. He's sick, and so part of the reason that he doesn't see God properly in the world or even in the scriptures is precisely because of that fallen aspect uh, to humanity. That's that's a, a, a deficiency in our being, a corruption within our very being. And so what we do, what, what we think is the process of getting all that fixed is theosis deification, the process of going through that restoration uh, and that healing process that brings us back to the um, knowledge of God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the the problem is, I know you're not going to, <laughs> you're not you're not uh, arguing that this is a a, a major point um, for or a major argument for God or for for religion. No, I just wanted to to point out that it's different than what you hear in like Roman Catholic or Protestant Christianity. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. I get, I get, I got it, I got it. Yeah. The, the the issue is that we have so many things in in human history that are based on um on on how humans are trying to understand the world around them, uh, which uh, don't exactly tell us tell us much uh, truth about the the reality of our universe or the or the reality of where we uh, came from. And all that. If you look at history, um, it is quite interesting, actually, how much we take it for granted nowadays that we know we live in a big universe or in a vast universe, or or we know that uh, that we are in a galaxy and we know there are other galaxies. We know we are in a solar system. There are other planetary systems. These are things that we didn't even know until uh, very recent times. It wasn't. It, it was. It was entirely unknown until just. Uh, just a century ago, actually, that we live in a vast universe. It was unknown uh, till a few uh, centuries ago that there are that there are other galaxies, that there are planetary systems which we cannot, uh, which which are outside of our system. That the sun is not the center of everything. That the earth is not the center of everything. If we want to go chronologically back, so humans have for uh, quite a long time, up until the last uh, few thousand years and up un until the last century, had very uh, very false fundamental beliefs about the, the the nature of our of our world and of life in this in this universe. So we can actually see that much of what we see in human history when we look at ideas and beliefs <clears throat> is com is based on complete misconceptions is based on people simply trying to understand this nature that they are born into uh if, even if you look into the history of god for example the the history of um <clears throat> 
The history of monotheism, as far as we can document, it doesn't go back further than 3,000 years. Uh, the, the, the oldest documents that we have that exist go back uh, about, about, about 3,000 years, I believe. It's like uh, 1,000 BC is the oldest existing remaining, I'm saying remaining document uh, on, on, the, on, on, the, on the one God of the, of the Israelites. Uh, correct me if, I, if I'm if I'm wrong on that, but as far as I know, we don't have any documents that precede that. We do, however, have uh, documents about uh, other deities and other beliefs that uh, go maybe almost one thousand to two thousand years uh, beyond that into the past among Middle Eastern cultures. We see if we look at um, old artifacts, old uh, buildings, the first religious buildings, we see that people have had uh, religious beliefs that greatly differ from monotheism and focus more on uh, on pantheism or polytheism or henotheism or many other many other things um, from 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 thousands of years ago, from much longer ago from much longer before monotheism came into existence as far as we can historically document it that's what i'm i'm not saying that's how it is i'm saying as far as we can historically uh document it uh if we look at history we see that uh for example the belief that life is um that that, that the world that the universe is this uh recurring cycle that everything is going into a cycle uh is going in a cycle destruction and uh you know new creation destruction new creation destruction new creation uh that belief, for example, is much older and much more universal than the belief of monotheism, which only became universal within the last two thousand years. Before that, it was only a tiny religion among uh, the, among the among, among the Hebrew Israelites. Uh, so, if we, if we want to look at the history of things, that is actually one more reason why I why I think, why should we believe in the one God? Add to that the age of the, the earth, the age of the universe, add to that uh, dinosaurs, add to that uh, life that goes far beyond human existence. Why would we come up with the explanation that it is God? It simply seems like something that humans came up because they didn't know better. Sorry, what's the wrong talk? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, uh, there's a whole host of topics there. Uh, yeah. I first thing I would say is uh, you should just stop me if it gets too long. That's <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm just thinking. So, like, you threw out a whole bunch of different kind of you know issues that like skeptics and uh, you know atheists will bring up, which is fine. I don't mind that. But before we kind of go into the all the different ones that you brought up there, there's there's a kind of a running thing that I've noticed in our discussion, which I would like to call attention to that that I think undergirds the questions of you know, looking at these ancient texts, dating these ancient texts. What about this scientific problem? What about this point with, uh, you know, Copernicanism or whatever? Um, you, you, you've you consistently appealed to things like, for example, when we were talking about the Mongols, you said, you know, all of the people in this situation wanted survival. Uh, all of us want this. Um, and you, you'll you say these sort of claims about uh you know, science has shown this, we know this, we know that. And there's a lot of these appeals to to what I would say are uh, pretty strong epistemic principles, right? So you would be making kind of universal claims. Maybe you would maybe you would qualify that and say, well, I didn't I was just speaking offhand. I didn't really mean that we have like this sort of absolute certitude, but it's Generalizations, mostly, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, exactly. To make generalizations, we need certain categories. We need certain things to be the case. And what a lot of people don't realize is that what has to be the case is a lot of philosophical and metaphysical baggage. And this is where we get into abstract concepts, abstract entities, and objects. And so for me, that's a much better way to approach these kinds of questions and issues rather than competing scientific claims about dating this text or that text. Because, I mean, I do have a significant section of the library that deals with, for example, dating biblical mm -hmm. texts, um, looking at ancient texts. Uh, and it's not wrong to go into that. I could give you different books that, that discuss it from our perspective. But the difficulty is that you'll just kind of get into this back and forth of, well, uh, scholar X claims this, scholar Y claims this. And so we're going to be throwing papers back and forth and, and scientific references. But one thing that we can't throw back and forth is the questions of, 
uh, objective epistemological principles, objective metaphysical principles, etc. That's why I, as a philosopher, I think I approach those things from that vantage point. Um, I, I don't see how you could uh, uh, have generalizations without appealing to universals, universal concepts, um, which I think have to be something more than just in the human mind. So I would just simply ask you, look, if you're going to do science, right, there's a lot of philosophers who have shown, for example, that science depends on math. Uh, Frege uh, has some good essays on this. Um, Husserl has some good essays on this, the logical investigations, where he talks about how logic is actually undergirding the scientific method. Mm -hmm. So if a person is going to be an empirical scientist, right, they want to do empirical data research, et cetera, et cetera. I want them to tell me how they make sense of the things that are immaterial, non-empirical, that undergird the scientific process. Now, when they can explain that to me, maybe then I'll listen to them when they tell me about their claims of dating this or that ancient text of whether monotheism was uh, you know, the, the first uh, religion or not. And by the way, on that point, Christianity, uh, we, we would actually say that monotheism is the original religion, if you mean the sense of God in the beginning in Genesis, that is the true religion. We think it's Jesus there in the garden. It's the Trinity. It's the triune God. And then we see the rest of the religions uh, kind of being a kind of a schism of that true religion, even in the ancient uh, you know, Old Testament Israelite period. Uh, we think we are in continuity with the Old Testament Israelite church, so to speak. The church is really for us just the New Testament or the, the fulfillment of Israel, so to speak. This is actually a point I bring up against Muslims quite a bit because I don't think Islam has any consistency when it comes to trying to make sense of the Old Testament law and the prophets. They're out of totally out of uh, continuity. And one of the strongest arguments for Christianity, I think, is the continuity. But that's a different issue. But back to abstract objects, I would just say that, I mean, do you think that your paradigm or your worldview could give an account for abstract objects? I would turn the question around. Well, um, I first want to say, uh, when, when, I, when I talk about the, uh, the scientific details, I, mean, I said at the beginning that I don't believe we can uh, prove or disprove God based on, uh, on scientific discussions, based on how you know, science uh, does or does not agree with right. uh, the existence of a God. So uh, the, but my point there was not to, to, to really make a science argument against God. It was merely to, uh, to, to address the, um, the, 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 the change in history of how humans have perceived the world around us and how, how they have explained things, how their explanations have changed over time, how um, you know, people have... Uh, have begun to understand to understand the universe okay. in quite different ways compared but, to. But many, but isn't that kind of a, a a perspective or a point that really could be interpreted within either one of our paradigms? I mean, an atheist could explain that. Of as, course, yeah, sure. As just like the world coming to uh, you know better scientific understanding. I mean, mm -hmm. even conceivably, a Christian could could make that same point that like, well, yeah, we we understand a lot more about the natural world than we did two thousand years ago. So, That's so I don't really see how that kind of like. No, I would even say that I would even say that um, in the development of human uh, history, uh, religion is a more advanced state than organized religion in terms of Christianity, for example, is a more advanced state in human development than uh, than than many uh, pagan civilizations or quite. Uh, you know, civilizations that relied on personal uh, favorite gods or stuff like that for example yeah. so i would definitely not make an argument and say hey uh you know time times change and uh it's all better than religion that doesn't work so, 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 okay so to boil down my question earlier when you say uh like a, a, a an organized christian religion based civilization is better what is the standard by which you're coming to the that that better there Good question. <laughs> uh, I would I would um, argue for pragmatism and again what works. Uh, when I think about for, uh, several months ago, I believe um, I was sitting here and watching a video in which uh, Muslims talk about Muslim missionaries talk about how they um, go to a distant, untouched tr 
tribe and try to invite those people, try to invite that untouched tribe to Islam in order to uh, bring this untouched tribe into the folds of Islam. It's kind of a weird approach. Why would you focus on that is what I thought at the moment. And I thought uh, my first reaction was, man, leave those people alone. You know, They don't need your religion. Leave them alone. They are, they are living their lives in peace. Leave them alone. That's what I thought at the moment. Uh, but later I thought, okay, maybe there is actually something good about this. If I think about um, when people ask me, what is one thing that you like about Islam? I usually say there is nothing that I like about Islam at all. Everything is horrible about it. Uh, everything leads to something terrible, leads to something horrible. But, but there's one thing that I like about it, which is that it has organized societies. Uh, it could have other ideologies, other religions could have come like Christianity and could have organized societies in a much better way. Uh, Islam organized them and turned them into vile societies. Sorry for saying that it might sound offensive to other people in our time. But, uh, it is, but, but Islam did nevertheless organize very primitive societies and uh, turned them into societies that function, that have cer certain uh, institutions, that have certain aspects that are divided into different functions where there is a government, where there, is a, there are financials, where people uh, uh, educate themselves, where they engage in military actions for the survival of themselves and so on. When I uh, look at the history of humanity, I think, um, I think one thing that we all want is to go forward and to, uh, to, to be happier, to feel better, to have more power in our lives. We don't want to live forever. We want to live better. That's what we eventually want. We don't want to, we don't want to live forever. We want to live better forever. That is uh, what I what I see. Human. This is just. This is my. This is my. Uh, this is how I view it. I'm not saying this is a fact. Uh, in in that regard, I would think that if a religion comes and sets clear universal rules for people and says, "Hey, uh, you shall not. You shall not kill. You shall not do this. You shall not do that. You should do this and do this and do that. Read this. Educate yourself. Do that. That is better for all of us than if." Uh, people are just left to themselves running around naked in forests and not doing anything productive at all. And wow. I'm basing this merely on uh, on human productivity and pragmatism. We want to be better. In order to be better, we need to organize. And, and religion has done that in, in history. Well, uh, what about Rousseau? I mean, if you read Rousseau, uh, he will give the exact opposite interpretation. He will say, is it not obvious, my fellow atheist friends, that that uh, civilization is uh, ruined by religion, that religion and civilization kind of go together to hold on to. I'm just saying, I'm not saying this is true. I'm saying that he will give on a pragmatic basis the exact opposite interpretation and say, look, civilization turns us into soy boys. It turns us into weak, you know, uh, pleasure seeking, just kind of hedonists laying around why don't we get back to nature, go be savages, uh, you know, out in the middle of, of, you know, tribes in the middle of nowhere. Maybe that's the better pragmatic solution. So that's one counter example I would give is that, that you could probably just turn that around because pragmatism isn't really uh, self-evident. It's not exactly clear <laughs> what, what works for who, right? So let's say I may, um, uh, I want to be God emperor. All right, so I've been reading a lot of Dune. I really like, uh, you know, Frank Herbert's Dune novel, uh, and it's really touched me deep down. I want to be God Emperor of the Universe, and so for me, what works is to crush everyone as best I can, <laughs> anyway, uh, and that's pragmatic. <laughs> so pragmatism for who, and on what basis can we judge? which pragmatism we do and don't accept. Now you might say, well, I'm gonna be a utilitarian. I'm gonna to appeal to what's best for most people. And my reply is gonna be, well, how do you know that, that uh, utilitarian happiness for the biggest quantity of people is somehow better than utilitarian happiness for an individual in terms of quality? There's no clear a way to adjudicate between the quantity of pleasure as opposed to the quality of pleasure. Maybe I get like a zillion pleasure points when I crush, you know, uh, uh, my, cross your enemies. What is, uh, you know, the, the phrase from mm -hmm. Conan when he's like, what is life? Well, it's to see your enemies cross before you, to hear the lamentation of the women, right? Like maybe that's the ultimate like 
utilitarian quality principle as opposed to quantity. And I think uh, in terms of the utilitarian kind of explanation that I hear you giving, most of the time people just assume that it means, well, uh, you know, for the most people. Why? On what? There's nothing a priori that tells me that I should please the most people. Maybe I should just be like an individual God emperor. Well, the, the issue is... Um nobody probably has an obligation to agree with what I think is best for society. And uh, maybe inherently no one has the obligation to abide by, by what I think is best for humanity. But to assert that, uh, do you want to? No, you know, you go ahead. I just have a point there. That's a, I mean, okay. I, that's a good turn of, of argument there. I see where you're going. <laughs> so, um, when you say maybe it is maybe it is good for me, maybe it is good in my opinion to 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 crush and to kill and to spill blood and to be rich and to 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 make myself rich and do this and that. Yes, you could say that, and that is your point of view. That's you know fine. I have no objection to that. I will not say no. You ha you are not allowed to have this opinion. You are not allowed to have this desire. No, I think you are totally entitled to that. But does it make sense? It doesn't. It is illogical to argue that that would be in the best interest. It would maybe be in the best interest of you, uh, and and I would agree. It would maybe be in the best interest of me to go out and to uh, take everyone's belongings, to uh, be the master of everything, to crush everyone who wants to take my stuff away. That would be, maybe be in the, be the best interest of me, but would it really be in the best interest of me? Because it will not work, and we have understood. I mean, people have understood that it doesn't work. I mean, imagine. Well, but wait a minute. You gave the example of the Mongols. I mean, of course, but it but that I mean, didn't work. It, it, only worked, it only worked for that time. It doesn't eventually work. The the Nazis, for example, I would go ahead and say the Nazis uh, thought it was the right thing to do to to act as they acted, and they really thought that they were onto something good. So but, something working really just equates with success. Uh, no, common interest. I will. I will come to that. Uh, common, common interest, greater benefits. Uh, you could say that fifty people can come together and can, for fifty years, rule with tyranny and be happy with that. But eventually, that will fall because it doesn't make sense. Uh, for example, the idea of liberalism is based on the idea that uh, that if we give uh, power to religious institutions and make them and put them in charge and allow them to uh, repress parts of the society, then society will uh, repeatedly find itself in uh, this continuity of uh, revolutions because one group will decide, hey, this is in our best interest, so we should oppress the other, and the other group will eventually emerge and try to overthrow that. And society will go through these revolutions over and over again, which is why it doesn't make sense. We cannot give power to a certain uh, religion. We cannot give power to a certain institution. It simply doesn't work. What okay. So but what I hear you doing is is turning the uh, the pragmatism argument into something that's subjective. So you, you seem to be saying that... No, no. Subjective to an extent. Pragmatism yeah. is an objective principle. Uh, you cannot you cannot say that. It's impossible to argue that uh, pragmatism is an, is an entirely objective is, is entirely objective. That's that's impossible. Well, but, to, but you to, said that I could have the opinion, or I, I could have the view that I want to be God Emperor. Yeah, sure, sure. But um, the thing is, uh, with, so with, these with are, but these are counter examples to show that to explain or justify pragmatism as what works doesn't work no um no so uh as said i could go ahead and say hey it is in our best interest to rule this way but think of it think of it this way there are two people uh that exist in an empty world if if one person exists by himself and there is no other human around him there is no society no one in the world at all and this person can just do whatever he wants then he can go out and do whatever he wants no one cares there's nothing right or wrong with anything that he does because he's not hurting anybody he's not harming anybody he's not infringing on anyone's right there is secularly seen nothing wrong with anything that he does at all if now a second person joins him in this in this world and the second person also uh, decides hey I I want to do whatever I want. I want to take everything that I see. Then uh, the, the, the interests of these two people will eventually start uh, conflicting and interfering with each other. And they sure. will have to, at some point, make an agreement. They will have to say, okay, come on, let's make an agreement with you. Uh, we are we both live here in this world. I don't take your stuff. You don't take my stuff without my permission. Yeah, but, because, but, but I, can, I can feign uh, this agreement in order to crush him down the road. Of course you could, but... 
it, once you form a civilization, it once you form, once you have more people around you, is that really is that really the way to go? Will that really result in success for everybody? No, you can say this is how you want to live, and I have no objection. But, to but that, see, yeah. you, you keep appealing to success when I've asked for what success is, and you've equated it with pragmatism and what works. So I'm trying to figure out where is the justification or explanation of what it is that makes pragmatism true and what actually is working? What does it mean to work? And you say, well, it's it's not one guy kind of setting up his own thing. It's everybody kind of working together. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that 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 is not self-evident. I want to know why that's the case or what is. is the justification for that? It is. If I want to go out and want to kill people and want to take uh, everything that they have, if I think that is uh, good for me, then I am I am basically uh, shortening my own life and endangering my own life by but turning that that's into begging the question because maybe I oh, get cool. a lot of pleasure out of a wild 20 years as opposed to a sublime, subdued 50 years. Of course. But society eventually doesn't come to conclude that yes, we should just we should just go ahead with that because it is pleasurable. I mean, it it is kind of it is kind of a logical conclusion. If you want to appeal to uh, to the argument that, that that societies have always believed in something, for example, which is why there probably is something, then you could say societies have all always come to eventually conclude that they should put their disagreements aside. Uh, establish certain rules because we have to be calm we have to respect each other because that is better for us we all even even if you want to live your life wildly and want to take everyone's possessions it eventually doesn't work your life gets shorter you you, so you live in a you live with less then, peace right but no so okay. the explanation right but it, does, explanation, it doesn't give you peace it doesn't give you peace it, it doesn't result in a desire these, these are all circular arguments i'm asking for why you can't just say because this is better <laughs> I'm asking, I want to know like what the standard is to know. Maybe it's actually better to have a lot of death, chaos, and destruction. Why? Uh, and we prep, why on not? What basis? On what basis is it better? Right, exactly. <laughs> on no, what no, basis no. is it or isn't better? I mean, no. as a Christian, if, we have- If you could justify that, if you could justify that, why, why could it possibly be better for societies to just conclude, hey, it's, it's the right thing to uh, just constantly be violent to each other, kill each other, and just to take from each other. I mean, there are, there have been plenty of uh, you know important thinkers and philosophers who have held to that view. It's, right? it's I mean, a stupid view, I would say, because it doesn't right. make sense that, that you cannot give an example of on, one okay, society. On one base, on again, so you have in order to to justify a claim, you have to be able, for example, to explain how it's coherent and the rest of what you believe. It has to have explanatory power, right? So justifying something as a, as a claim, you can't just appeal to, well, it works and it works because it makes things better and it makes things better because people live longer. Those are not justifications. I wanna know why we should prefer that to living shorter and having a lot wilder time. I'm not saying I believe that. I'm saying that there's, know, nothing, that's, there's nothing that's self-evident that tells you to prefer one over the other, just like there's nothing self-evident that, that tells you to prefer quantitative pleasure over qualitative pleasure. This is a classic problem for utilitarian. I, I understand that. I understand that, uh, which is why it is argued that utilitarianism cannot be objective or, 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 or cannot be subjective. There are both, uh, both, both sides to that whole discussion. And uh, for, for that exact reason, for the exact objection that you're bringing, uh, it, is, it is a claim that utilitarianism cannot be objective, that pragmatism cannot be objective, because there is always the one person in society who doesn't want to play by the rules and who no, thinks- It doesn't even have to be one person. I mean, they're, yeah, they're all- sure. Right. sure, sure. But uh, the thing is, I am not, here is the issue. Uh, I am saying this is seemingly better for humans in the long run. It is seemingly better on for humans basis, in the long on run. On what basis is it better? I'm, I'm explaining. This is seemingly okay. better for, for humans in the in the long run to make peace and to work toward making their own lives better in order to uh, to live better, to have peace, to have to have what they desire, which is comfort in life. Anything else just brings you back to living a, con a constantly anxious life where you run and you are in fear you have to look over your shoulder all the time and you have to you have to kill and and survive okay. I now, understand now, that, that now, we want that but that's not an argument I know I know I know I know I know I, I I completely understand that and I completely understand that there may be one person or maybe hundred people or maybe millions of people who think hey I don't want to live that way I, I, I want to live my life wildly I want to have uh, fun and I enjoy living by just killing other people and you know shedding blood and whatever it is. But the thing is that is that is true. People can have that idea, but 
when has that ever become the norm in the long term? It has never, ever been established to be a system that people eventually agreed upon. It has never worked. It has never gone that way. Well, I people mean, there's, eventually... there's an ambiguity there because empires, for example, uh, rise. They rise on conquering and then they fall. I mean, the very example really? that you get with Mongols, right? I mean, you can get this kind of a situation of them rising and falling. And oftentimes empires fall prey to over uh, extending in terms of their expansion, colonialism, and then eventually the empire collapses from within, usually by things like money printing or debt or something like this. So, uh, I mean, there's, a, there's an ebb and a flow to history, but w what I'm saying is more fundamental than that, that in an epistemic sense, I'm asking for a justification for the argument that, that you're making. And all I'm saying is that you keep making a circular uh, appeal to the fact that it makes things better and it makes things better because it works and it works because it makes things better. And I'm just saying that that's, that's not a valid argument. Well, it's, it's, uh, the, the thing is uh, you're asking for something that we can never conclude that we can uh, ne never agree upon. You have to, you are asking for so an, an objective. Were, as an atheist though, you believe in doing logic and arguing logic. No, 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 no. You're asking for uh, an objective basis for a morality upon which we can agree that something is good. So but there's such, nothing so there's nothing a, objective about morals? Such a such a basis cannot exist. Is it's, that objective hold on, is that objectively the case about morals that there's no objective truth about morals? <laughs> but it it can it cannot uh it cannot be true. I mean as far as if you look at it religiously it is must that be true. universally the case? Uh that claim I would say, itself. the claim that there cannot be an objective basis? Yes, it is true. Okay, so it's self-refuting. So there's a universal claim about morals that morals cannot have universal claims. Well, no, that is that is. I would classify that as sophistry. I mean, <laughs> uh, no, it's not sophistry if it's an argument about basic principles. Well, it it it, does, it doesn't it doesn't refute the point. Uh, you are you are demanding you are demanding that there must be an objective basis that there must be an objective. No, I'm just I'm not demanding. I'm asking you to explain your position. And you said that there are objective truths about morals. Namely, the one is that there is no objective truth about morals. It's not sophistry, it, unless you I, think all I don't, contradictions I don't, are sophistry. I don't. I don't think that is objective. I say. I. Uh, I would. I would say this is in the in the greater interest. Most people desire this, but this cannot be objective, as I said. Well, but other, you did say other it was people, objective. Other people are saying that it's not. I mean, you, you did no. use the phrase that it is objectively the case that there is no objective morals. No, I said it is objectively the case that there cannot be uh, an objective basis. Okay, that's an objective that, claim that's universal about morals. That is true, but uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> that, that is true, but you no, cannot. That's a contradiction. It's it's not. It's not. That doesn't make sense. You cannot. You cannot expect there to be an objective uh, basis I mean, for I morals. It, if it, it's the argument that you made. You made the <laughs> argument that it's a. <laughs> but but that doesn't make sense. That's a fallacy. I mean, you cannot expect. It is a fallacy. To, correct. Right. You cannot expect there to be uh, you, to be an objective basis for moral values if something like that simply cannot exist. It's it simply it simply cannot exist. It's simply not logical for that to exist. Okay, that's a universal claim, right? No, I mean you just it, said it cannot. Of course, those are it, strong words in logic. Impossible sure, but cannot. so those are those are like universal quantifiers in logic. I'm, yes, yes, but you cannot uh, you, you cannot say that that is a contradiction. That's that's simply it, is a it, does, it doesn't make it's, sense. No. Well, it doesn't make sense because it's a contradiction. There is no objectivity in this. And, and just because, and just because you say claim that requires objectivity. Well, you could say, okay, you could say some people, some people may uh, argue that there are objective moral values and that there is an objective basis for moral. No, no I'm not doing you that. I'm looking at the claim that you made. There, there is no contradiction in that. There is. No, you would have to explain how it. Uh, you would have to. You would because have to it's a universal claim, claim that. that says there are no universal claims. <laughs> That's a contradiction. That is not. A, that is not a point. It doesn't make sense. You it cannot, doesn't make sense because it's not consistent. No, it's a contradiction. No, I, I cannot even. I don't even know how to respond to that. I cannot even uh, think of an equivalent to that argument because it's. It, it simply doesn't make sense to me. But you cannot say that uh, that the non-existence of objective moral values contradicts with the idea that objective moral values cannot exist, or no, that uh, that the non-existence of not of objective moral values is. Uh, a contradiction to the claim that there can be nothing objective. You cannot claim that because it Let's simply it really cannot simple. exist. Right. So there are no universal claims. Is a universal claim when you add this word no? That's a strong claim. You see, that well, is what, itself what, what, what a is universal your, claim. So that's what contradiction. Is, what is your solution to that? 
Well, I don't make the claim that there are no universal objective. What, what is your solution? Your solution is that your solution to that is that there must be uh, an objective basis for moral values, and you base that uh, judgment on the claim. I base that the argument first on this transcendental argument that this doesn't work. So therefore, since this is self-refuting, there are universal claims. That is that that doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't. Does sense. It, does, it doesn't. Read book four of Aristotle where he makes the same argument. I mean, it's an argument that's been around for a long time. I'm that's, not trying to be. No, I know, I know, but that's an argument for the existence of God. I mean, it, it is. Oh, it is, hold on. No, no, no. No. It, in book four, it's sorry, not an argument sorry, for God. Sorry, sorry, no. For the existence of uh, of an of an exterior of of a system upon upon which uh, upon which you know morality is. Uh, depends on something that we do not decide. So, so hold on. So, so, so this, this argument, hold on. So this argument has moved it out of the domain of morals and just into the domain of universal claims. And when Aristotle makes this argument in book four, he's just making an argument for how you have to believe in objective, immaterial things, mm -hmm. like logic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so we're not necessarily talking about God right now. I'm just saying that this form of argument that I'm using here is an ancient argument that's been used for a long time. It's, it's a type of transcendental argument, which just shows in this reductio that you can't make a all-encompassing universal quantifier claim about all states of affairs and then turn around and say there are no all states of affairs, you see. The thing is that 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 in itself is actually circular reasoning. The claim is that there must be a, um, a, a core to the whole, um, to, to the to the whole moral argument, to for morality to exist, for meta -ethic, ethics to exist, which is uh, yes, I, I to, believe to our that discussions. Meta but, level arguments are circular, correct? So yeah, that is the that is the case. Then the the, the whole um, so we are we are judging the whole uh, the whole argument that objective moral values cannot exist. Uh, that that claim is a contradiction because it contradicts with itself. Right. With, with the claim that there is nothing objective. Right. We simply base that judgment on our own man-made expectation that there must be such a consistency in the world. No, it's not man-made. It is the man argument. That is the argument. The argument is that to claim that it's not objective leads to self-refutation. That itself is an argument. Of course, but that but that, that argument is completely based on the assumption that there must be such a rule. It, it, that, that, that rule no, the is... argument demonstrates that it is the case. No, it's simply yes, it, yeah, it, 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 it attempts to do so. It attempts to do so by creating a rule but uh, upon it's not which creating a rule. Rule logic is not created, it's discovered. <laughs> That's the thing. Fine. I mean, if it was created, could we create it otherwise? Uh, it, it is it is like saying, uh, for example, that uh, it, it is the same thing with the whole existence of God. If you want to go back to, uh, if we would, if we would go back, I'm not going back right now. But well, if let me we ask you if you think this to... is valid, because this is another form of the same type of argument. If I said X is the necessary condition of Y, and then I posit Y, therefore X, right? You are saying if, that, yeah, if, I know. If Y is the case, and Y can only be if X, if I posit Y, Therefore, X, right? So that's I, know, I know, but but the but the, the argument here is uh, you, you, uh, one objective is about one thing, while the other objective is about the other thing. One uh, the one claim is that there can be no objective uh, basis for moral values, and then uh, I'm also you are asking me whether I think that that is an objective claim, an objective uh, yeah, an objective claim yeah, because it has uh, that I, word. I say, there I say, can be no. I say, I say yes, yeah. I say yes, and you say that's a contradiction, but you're simply saying that's a contradiction because you are evaluating both of these uh, claims based on the assumption that uh, that this is that, uh, that 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 one kind of objectivity is equal to the other kind of objectivity, that these two things are equal in meaning. It's like arguing that... Uh, You've lost me there. I don't know what you're saying. It, it is like arguing that for everything to exist, God must exist. And if everything if everything uh, exists, or everything I'm must not, have been I'm created... I'm not making these arguments. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know, but it is similar to the argument that uh, in order for everything to exist, there must be a creator. And if everything exists, then... I don't, I don't make a first cause argument. Of course, but it, it is it is it's very similar. similar to that it is very similar to their it's argument. Tot, no, that's that's a classical argument. Transcendental arguments have the di a different form than all the classical arguments. Okay. You could take a classical argument for God and put it into a transcendental form, but they're two different types of arguments. Mm -hmm. But 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 again, um, we should move, we should probably move away slowly from this. But uh, 
because we're not talking about the existence of God. I thought I thought that's what this discussion was supposed to be about. Uh, probably my fault. Well, I, no, I, I mean, I did say early on that that when I talk about abstract objects and these kinds of formal arguments, those are the types of arguments that I believe are, are the most convincing, the strongest arguments for God's existence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, as said, uh, the whole discussion, the whole argument is simply based on the premise that uh, that the claim that objective moral values cannot exist or uh, an objective basis for moral values cannot exist. And that uh, that, that, that in, its, in and of itself is an objective claim, which is why it is illogical and doesn't make sense. But uh, there has been a whole uh, discussion on on, 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 on that, and I'm not a philosopher myself. I'm not. I'm by no means professional. I'm self-educated. I have uh, introduction philosophy education, plenty of uh, self-education, all that stuff. So I would definitely not uh, be able to go into uh, all the counter arguments uh, on that. But it simply, it, it is simply circular reasoning. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to be. We don't. We can move on. We don't have to obsess over this. But it, I mean, it doesn't take like a. Uh, a training to see that those are two contradictory claims. I don't I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm just saying that. No, I, I don't think it's contradictory. They are, they are uh, on the surface, you know, contradictory mm -hmm. claims. Yeah, I don't think it's contradictory. Because <laughs> I, I don't think, I don't okay. think, uh, I don't okay, think, it is, it, it is, I don't think it is necessary to, uh, to say that uh, we have to, um, we, I, I don't think it is, it is necessary to, to, to judge, uh, the whole statement that there can be no objective moral values by the same expectation, by the same standard that uh, that this, you know, that that this is an objective statement, which is why it is wrong. Because I just said there is there are no objective moral values. I simply do not think that that is a contradiction because those two observations of objectivity are not the same thing. They're entirely different. If I say something wow. cannot exist, well, if then, I say, then so so when say, you say that there are no and cannot. Uh, they don't have the normal meaning that they're supposed to have. No, if I if I say if I say something cannot exist, then it simply means that that thing does not exist. I don't have to somehow be logically consistent in that issue. If if something doesn't of exist, it doesn't exist. If you don't have to be logically consistent in claims about what does and doesn't exist, then then why should we believe in skepticism or atheism? No, it, it is it is illogical to expect that there are objective moral values when when such a thing simply cannot be true. It simply cannot exist. Or uh, well, I mean, you keep, or, or you, you, keep, you keep saying and asserting that, and then when I ask how you can have access to a universal state of affairs like that, okay, maybe I, I maybe. Maybe your uh, maybe the, the whole the whole assumption goes to goes to um, to 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 conclude or to uh, expect of me, for example, to present the idea that there can be uh, no objective goal or no objective value, no objective aim for for humans. Uh, I would say I would say it is in every human's best interest to live a. A comfortable life. Every human we know, it's like we, okay. we know it's like a lot. So, but again, you're okay, to. right? But you're using all of these qualifiers that are that are universal. They're called every, or right? you're saying every, every it is. No, this is a, this is a fact. We know that every human uh, seeks comfort. Okay, but but this you just said that that there's no objective states of affairs. Or well, I would I would say I would say if we are arguing about an uh, about an ethical framework. About ethical frameworks, there is no, uh, there can be no world in which. Okay. Uh, can, can I ethical... ask? A, can I ask a metaphysical question about ethical frameworks themselves at a meta level? And can I ask you on what basis are do you have knowledge claims about ethics? And that's when it transfers into the domain of universal claims. You see, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can keep saying that. I, look, I don't think there's universal objective ethics. I understand that. But when you start to say things about all states of affairs, it doesn't matter whether it's about ethics or, or, or other stuff, that's when you're starting to get into what are called universals. And that's the problem that we're at here is that if you are an atheist, you really don't have a way to explain or justify the ability to make uh, universal claims. I'm not saying that you don't or can't do it. You are doing it, but rather to justify how you can do that. Okay, now, in uh, the Christian paradigm, we can do it because we believe that we're made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there is the, there is the one uh, thing that I may be stuck on, which is uh, that I would argue it is not uh, possible to say that there is uh, one 
framework, one ethical framework that should be considered uh, universal, and that is objectively true. Okay, that it, it is not possible to say that. that, right? But in I, logic, I, okay. I see, I see, I see, I see. You're uh, making really strong claims. I know, I know, I know. Strong uh, claims. I know, I know. It transfers it into the domain of universals and so okay, forth. Okay, okay. Let me get somewhere. Uh, in, so, in in psychology. Um, People have concluded. It has been concluded about, uh, I believe, thirty years ago, that um, it is. It was kind of a, a brilliant insight that uh, children, that offsprings of uh, mammals, seek comfort. That that it is universal of all of us. That uh, we naturally uh, seek comfort. We seek this. We seek this physical uh, closeness to our to a mother, for example. This comfort is something that 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 that. that that offsprings of monkeys desire. They desire it more than food. They need food for survival, which is true. But uh, more than desiring uh, this one necessity, which is food, they desire to be close to a mother, to somebody physically, in order to feel comfort. Uh, thereby, it has been established that uh, it is absolutely true that humans seek comfort. Humans all want comfort. And whether uh, whether you find that comfort by living a rather peaceful life or by asserting your power, or power over the rest of, of humanity and shedding blood, that is debatable. But what is true is that, yes, we are all seeking comfort in life. That is uh, pretty much a scientific conclusion. Uh, and and that that is, yes, indeed, objectively true. That is objectively true. That we that 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 humans and other mammals desire uh, comfort. Now, uh, well, hold on. Hold can, on. Now, do you think that's universally true? I think that's universally true. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do yes. you have access to universal states of affairs? Uh, well, I. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean you're a finite guy. I assume that you probably believe in empirical research, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. empirical research ever get you to a universal state of affairs? Well, um, as as said, this is um, th this is based on the on this on the scientific uh, method by which we conclude right. uh, by which we, we conclude that uh, this is our observation. This is uh, what we prove based on uh, based on this number, based on this control group. Um, we see that this is a universal behavior. Uh, but it's not. And, and if it does, point. if it if it if it doesn't exist, no. If it doesn't exist, then there is a disorder in play. For example, this okay. is the current conclusion in uh, in psychology. If somebody doesn't seek this comfort, then there is a there is a mental disorder in play, a personality disorder or a mood disorder in play. This is the uh, the, the 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 expectation, the nature that people and other mammals have. So that is actually concluded if in the future there was a point and humans uh, humans came to the conclusion, hey, uh, yes. This uh, was maybe not entirely true. Okay, maybe so there's something would different. Not be a to universal it. state of affairs. At the point it is. I mean, at, at the point we think that it is, and that's so. What you, so universal truth claims can turn into the opposite of themselves. Well, um, in the scientific method, that's how things work. We uh, right, but we, that's we assume... why the scientific method can't give you universal states of affairs and truth we, claims. Of course, that's what I'm of course, we can we can only we can only agree that this is what we currently think is true. This is what we've. Good, what then we it's not agree. universal. This is what we can only know is then true it's, based okay, on but based that on means that it's not universal. It is pretty much irrefutable. It can only alter in in, in the way that in, in so far that you just we, said it's, it can be different in the future. So no, it's not no, pretty no. much irrefutable. Detail, details about it can change. Details about it can change. We can we can say, oh, there was there was this detail about this specific thing that we know that was not exactly the way uh, we know it is. But we know for a fact that humans seek comfort. This is universal. A, a stable, so, healthy human okay, being. So I, I think you're, I'm not trying to be mean, but I don't think you're clear on what a universal is or what a universal claim no, is. No, I am. And the claim that's uh, the conclusion. So what you just said is not universal. a universal claim if it can be altered. The details of it can be altered. The 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 why we want it and, uh, and, and how we can uh, find comfort differently can be altered based on further uh, findings get, in the future. But you, no, but you don't get a universal from... Particulars. How from this particular to this yeah. particular to this the, particular? The idea, the idea universal that state of affairs. What the I, I don't. Where I'm is saying, those, so ideas saying, are universal? No, I'm saying the idea that humans see comfort. That is a universal truth. If we we only how we do only you know make, that's a universal truth? We only make exceptions to that based on uh, people who have disorders, for example, which is why we call disorders because well, it doesn't agree so with the nature. I understand that you believe that. 
But how do you know that that's a universal truth epistemically? How do you we, derive that? We, we, sim we simply know that. We simply know that. We simply uh, we, we that's research. That's a circular argument. No, we, no, that's an ad hoc. No. We simply know okay. that. No, you can't say that just is. That was a wrong choice of words. I, I agree. That was a wrong choice of words. Uh, we know that. We know that by 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 making the research and by concluding that that's this a circular is, argument. So the empirical no. research is known by the circular that, empirical research. Then you cannot. Then you cannot assert that anything uh, out there is, is is true at all. That we cannot know the nature about anything. That we can. No, I don't, believe, no I, don't believe that, I don't believe that universals are known by empirical sense data. Well, as, as far as I understand, uh, it is it is pretty much it is it is possible. We know by going through something over and over again and having uh, abundant results and observations in a matter. So of I would recommend. I would recommend. For example, for example, we know that David we know that Hume, you'll see how that's not that's not giving you a universal uh, principle, right? So we know, for example, that dinosaurs exist simply based on the fact that we have observed their bones. I mean, you're you're missing the argument. So David Hume makes this point about induction, which is that. The mere fact that you observe 20 different instances of some phenomena does not give you a universal rule or justification for belief in a universal rule. I'm not saying that you can't posit those things, but there's a difference between positing something and believing something and giving an explanation and a justification for that belief. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I see your point, but uh, I, think this, I think this pretty much established that... Uh, this research, for example, if we have enough enough data, it is concluded that this is something that is absolutely okay, that, 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 that is universally true. Have what? You read Kuhn? No, no. Okay, so structures of scientific revolution shows that uh, in various centuries, scientific revolutions occur that change entire paradigms. So what mm -hmm. you said mm -hmm. right there would be totally contrary to to Kuhn. Okay. Okay. Well. Uh, Fine. Let's move. Uh, we, we can move away from that. We can move away. To, we can move to uh, the whole idea of why we believe in the uh, the existence of God. But um, you know, the the whole idea, the whole idea of that was uh, how can we how how can I judge? I think that was your your question at the very beginning. How can I judge uh, God's judgment? On on what basis of morality can I can I judge that? That was your whole question. Then we went into uh, how I can uh, come to objective moral conclusions. What my basis for my morality is. Uh, we went into a whole bunch of detail there, but um, as said, the whole claim at the beginning was that it simply seems illogical, inconsistent within itself, that God would create everything, um, make certain moral rules, and uh, judge humankind unjustly so much that uh, it is impossible for for each one of us to um, for every one of us to come to the conclusion that God exists you said uh, sure we don't know what happens after death we don't know how God judges people but we do know that we are all created as uh, flawed human beings <clears throat> according to uh, the Christian narrative and that we are then as flawed human beings judged based on whether we are convinced that God exists or not although it is in our very nature to have doubts and to come to wrong conclusions. For example, if I question God's existence my entire life, and if I really want to believe, if I really want to listen to that inner me, which apparently, according to many, many theologians, has the right answer, and if I eventually come to the conclusion, hey, I don't think this is true, I, I think this is wrong, and I really want to believe it, but I don't believe in it, then I will be, by God's judgment, by the New Testament, judged and sent to eternal punishment because I didn't believe. And that simply doesn't seem logical. And, and, I, and I, don't think I, I don't think I need uh, to justify based on which moral basis I judge this. I think it is simply internally more, it is internally logically inconsistent, isn't it? Well, I mean, I, I hear your objections. They seem to be kind of repeating the objections at the beginning. Um, I think I addressed. Most that's where of we were, weren't we? That's where we were, and we didn't move on from that because we didn't solve the we didn't solve the paradox here. So my response to that would be that when we get into um, standards of judgment, when we get into questions of ethical norms, um, how we make value judgments, what happens is we're moving into the domain of higher order stuff, right? Abstracted yeah. stuff, uh, universal types of claims, judgments categories. And what I'm saying is that my argument, the transcendental argument, if you want it in summation, is that if we're looking for uh, justification for our claims, if we're looking for explanatory power, if we're looking for coherence in the paradigm, the Christian paradigm offers an explanation for that higher level stuff that I just listed that's actually 
um, assumed or undergirds the scientific method, moral judgments, and the analyzing history. All of those different things are assuming logic, assuming abstract <clears throat> categories, assuming these kinds of uh, non-empirical things that undergird the empirical operations. And even things like language and communication presuppose these kinds of metaphysical uh, structures and reality. And I would say that only the Christian paradigm justifies or explains and gives coherence to those higher order things that actually are presupposed in any moral judgment, any scientific operation, any any uh, uh, analysis of history, etc. But doesn't that, that is, mean that itself is the argument? But doesn't that mean we are moving away from a paradox that we cannot solve because we don't have a proper explanation to it and appeal to other reasons why we think God does exist and why Christianity is true? And that also based on conclusions like uh, you gave, for example, a logical, uh, a logical argument, a logical conclusion based on which you think the Christian God exists or based on which you think God exists. But it doesn't directly uh, point at the existence of a God. It merely points at the possibility of a God or the possibility of the oh, Christian God. I see. No, I would argue that when we get to the next stage of the argument, when we look at these abstract principles, that they actually require a certain type of God. And that's how I would make the move to the Christian God. Um, in, in, in how far does it require that there is a certain God, that there is a moment that there is one God who created everything? Well, for example, if I were to talk about uh, the abstract objects that are the patterns of the, of this world, they can't just be in an ether. They have to be in some single divine mind. And so that right there would be one indicator that the, the, the location or the grounding, so to speak, of all of these abstract principles and objects can't just be out there chaotically. They can't just be located in a human mind. They have to be in some mind, and it can't be just any mind. It has to be a kind of mind that gives it intention and purpose. And so that's why it's a God who's a creator, a personal God, and not like an abstract force like the Greeks believed in or something like that, right? Like Plato believed in forms or higher levels of reality, but he thought that they were kind of impersonal. And I'm saying that there's, a, there's an interesting insight there. I'm not a Platonist, but I'm saying that uh, it makes more sense to say that reality is uh, at its highest level personal and not impersonal. And so therefore reality and life has meaning as a whole because it's all sort of structured from the divine mind. Doesn't that, um, I mean, boiled down, it basically sounds to me like uh, all of this looks like it has to be, there has to be a designer or a creator, which is why. No, I'm not, I'm not but, making a, a, a teleology argument. I, I don't understand how we come to the conclusion that that points at a uh, at, at, at a single creator who has created everything. I, I simply I don't see the I don't see a, a solid uh, you know proof or argument that should conclude in yes there is one creator who is you know or or or, or God is true. I, I don't see how well, we get so that. so I, maybe I don't understand. What would you posit? Two gods? So all the abstract objects are what split down the middle between one God and another God? I mean, it's very easy to refute dualism if that's your 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 positive. Uh, I mean, that, would, that would make all of reality ultimately chaotic. I think that's that, pretty easy to refute. Um, the Quran makes that same claim. The Quran, for example, says, uh, I, I dealt with I dealt with that whole question when I was a Muslim. It's, it basically says if there was one if there were more gods as the polytheists believed, then then uh, then there would be great disorder or there would be chaos. So it it, it basically you know, makes I'm making a high I'm not just talking about chaos in the world. I'm saying that for abstract objects, the type of objects mm -hmm. that they are, they're invariant, they're immaterial, they're non-spatial. They require to be grounded in something beyond the physical or beyond the human mind. So we, we're limited in the types of things that we could ground it in. So if we were to try to say, oh, the universals and these kinds of things are in the minds of the gods, it wouldn't make any sense because the gods fight one another. So you have universals fighting one another, and it's just ludicrous, right? But if there's a single divine mind that undergirds and gives coherence <clears throat> to not just universals, but all of these kinds of abstract objects, that makes sense. That's a coherent paradigm. I'm not saying it's true because I posit it. I'm saying it's coherent, mm -hmm. and that is what lends uh, the the strength and the force of it of the argument is that the the whole paradigm is coherent. I'm not saying that it's true because I'm asserting it, right? And I'm saying that when we can compare a paradigm where we have one divine mind that is the undergirding and structure of reality, as opposed to a paradigm where 
it's materialism, it's pure chaos, it's a bunch of competing gods or something like that. Those systems are not coherent. I, I, it, it doesn't make sense to me why we would assume that if there was uh, more than one god, or if there were multiple gods, or if there were two gods, then they would be uh, they would be competing, or they, or they would be or they would be. You know, well, we have a whole history of polytheism, and that's what goes down in polytheism. So, if you want to construct a whole new polytheism, maybe you could make that argument. <laughs> Well, well, that's that's what they thought. You know, that's that's uh, probably a reasonable thing for people to believe that gods are basically higher beings that also are after power, that basically have these human desires, and that they would eventually end up uh, fighting each other, asserting power over each other, and so on. But I, I would say that um, that's a logical assumption that people probably had back then. But if we're talking about God, and if we're so, talking about this God that has to have a specific uh, nature that is far above us and that is perfect, why can't we imagine a system where eight gods exist or or or, or, or uh, infinite gods exist that are all naturally in, uh, in harmony with each other? So there's other perfect. philosophical things that I could bring in at this point, like the argument from the one and the many. So mm -hmm. we can't we can't have a true unity of multiplicity in the world if the uh, highest principle that we are locating this in is also distinct and separate beings, right? So if they're ultimately one and many at the same time, and that's the triune God, God, our God is unique in that regard, and that He's Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, in that regard, there's an ultimacy to both uh perfect unity and perfect multiplicity we don't put those in like a dialectical tension and if you were to say that the highest level of reality was multiple different gods that are separate beings then i would say that mm -hmm. wouldn't work you wouldn't have a high you would not have a um transcendent unity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay um but anyway we, but that's called the one in the many this is a, a famous uh, uh, mm -hmm. problem in history philosophy mm -hmm. if we come back to to though um the existence of of a god in and of itself and what points at the existence of of a creator of something that has to have uh brought all of this forth or that has to have created all of us like how do we how do we how do we come to that as i see it um all that we have is uh we look around us we see uh the universe we see the world we see beings we see people die we see uh people born we see that stuff happens in the sky and we think well okay um there has to be a creator to to something to, to, there has to be some creator to 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 all of this this cannot just exist on its own so there must be a creator that's well, how far I, I i see it that's how far i see the the argument goes how much well, does for, it go for us the other? doctrine of creation is a revealed doctrine so this is a doctrine that is in scripture now the ultimate authority for us or our highest epistemic authority would be divine revelation. So I'm not going to appeal to the claims of science necessarily as if that's above revelation. I believe that mm -hmm. true scientific discoveries do not contradict divine revelation. I don't have a problem with science. I think science is actually comes out of Byzantium and, and uh, Orthodox theology, historically speaking. So I don't have a problem with universities and, and science, but um, for us, the highest epistemic authority is going to be divine revelation. So I'm going to say that the, the scripture tells us the origin of the world. That's my first argument. And I accept it on the basis of uh, the fact that God revealed it. And I know that God revealed it because of the arguments that I've been presenting in this stream. I would say that would be my holistic approach. So I don't do like evidentialist apologetics. I do like a holistic mm -hmm. kind of transcendental argument. Uh, but then I would also say that there are other arguments from science uh, that do attest to the doctrine of creation. Um, I think that philosophically speaking, something like cyclical eternal return is self-refuting. I'm familiar with that. You mentioned that being uh, supposedly an older view. Um, that's based on uh, the presuppositions of unbelieving history saying that it's an older view. I don't think that it's an older view. I think that it's a later view that is uh, basically perhaps created by Indo-Europeans or perhaps Egyptians and then transfers into Greek philosophy. But yes, most of the Greeks believed in a kind of cyclical eternal return. Nietzsche rehashes this in modernity. I think it's very easy to refute that because it would basically boil into down to the idea that um, everything that we seem to experience as change uh, is illusory. If, I think if you mm -hmm. follow through with that argument and if everything that we see as, uh, as, as change is illusory, that kind of means that our experience in this world is illusory. And that oftentimes falls over into like a Far Eastern Maya type of view. Um, this is why a lot of people who get into for uh, like Greek philosophy or um, really deep into like Nietzschean type of stuff, they will usually fall into these kinds of influences of Buddhism or dualism or monism. And, and you can kind of 
go either way with those views, but we don't believe in any of those things. So we, we think that there is a uh, kind of a necessity to um, history having a linear scheme and it having a beginning, a middle, and an end. I think our lives have beginning, middle, and ends. And I think that beginning, middle, and an end is actually a transcendentally necessary category. We're beings that are so constituted to interpret uh, the world that way. And if you deny that, um, I, I think it, it leads to the impossibility of knowledge at all. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, I wouldn't even know what it means to say that, that there's no such thing as beginning, beginning middle, and an end. It's, it's funny. I'm, uh, I was smiling because I just listened to... Uh... To, to an analysis of that whole thing, basically of, 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 of everything that you have just described just uh, yesterday or, or, or the day before, because I was listening to um, to, to lectures regarding uh, Nietzsche's view of uh, the recurring mm -hmm. cycle of life. And, uh, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just... Yeah, sorry, have all, all have, you, ever, have you watched True Detective? What? Have you watched the show True Detective? No, I haven't. You should watch season one. It's pretty awesome because there's a scene when uh, Matthew McConaughey is referencing Nietzsche and he makes this point he's like you ever think about history as a flat circle that just goes around for all eternity <laughs> <laughs> nice I'll have a look <laughs> no I would think I would think there is a great absurdity in the the Indian um the Indic belief the Dharmic belief whatever you want to call it uh, mm -hmm. most mostly that um that life is all about that that there is a creation that uh, life is about release from this cycle of suffering that this is all that this will all come back and reemerge again and again i think it's uh to be honest i would think it's a bunch of nonsense it uh is unfounded but then again um as far as i understand your biggest reason to believe that there must be a creator is the scripture the revelation not that's the, my first appeal, but I'm not going to uh -huh. say that's the only. Yeah, I mean, I would make philosophical arguments too. Sure, uh -huh, uh -huh. but how can we? Um, we we have to when we look at monotheism, when we look at Christianity, for example, uh, we see the whole. Uh, correct me if you think I, I'm kind of misleading somewhere with this, but uh, God created, God existed. There was nothing but God in the beginning. <clears throat> And God was above the waters, and uh, God created uh, everything. God created heaven. God created Adam and Eve, so that they can uh, witness His glory. Uh, then He created this rule for them in heaven. Uh, Adam and Eve made a mistake or committed an evil act because they were misled by the serpent. And then God uh, created from them their offspring and punished them with this, uh, with 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 original sin. And now we are to live in this uh, temporary life, each one of us on average nowadays 70 years on this temporary life on this planet that uh, we have, that, that humans have developed civilizations on for thousands of years, just to eventually die and uh, go to a heaven where we will then permanently exist together with God to witness his glory and to glorify him. And for some reason, God created this. And for some reason, um, for many thousands of years, many people around the world, most people around the world never heard any of that stuff. Uh, and then Jesus came along 2000 years ago and uh, started declaring the good news to, uh, to his own people and then to the other people through the Romans converting to, to, to Christianity, for example. And this suddenly became this universal movement. But for a long time, we have people who heard none of that stuff. We still have the, the majority of mankind that will not uh, listen to or abide by Christianity. And for some reason, God created all of us and God created this strange system. Why would this be a reasonable thought? So a lot of the what you said, so you started off pretty accurate in terms of our view. Uh, then it sort of trailed off into more like a Protestant kind of idea of like when you die, you just kind of go and be a, this ghost in a ethereal floating realm with God. And But it's different. Can, can, can you clarify that with Orthodox Christianity? Yeah, like we, so we don't think that, that the creation of man was just merely to kind of trick man and see if he would fall it it was more so that the original intention was to we believe that jesus was always going to become incarnate that was the original intention of god was to um overcome different uh uh obstacles you could even say like one being that god desired out of his own goodness to share 
with other beings, his own life and his own goodness, his own being. And so he created the world ultimately to become uh, one of us, right? To become man, mm -hmm. not because to punish us, but actually to raise us. Uh, and so to raise us to a greater and greater status to become sons of God. Um, this is actually what we believe made Satan envious because he was an angel. Mm -hmm. He believed that angels should have had that preeminence and that not men because men were lower uh, on the status of uh, God's creation, you could say, Psalm 8. And so that's what kind of prompts this testing. Yes, God knew this, but God also had from the beginning hit the plan, as we said, to become incarnate. And it's the action of Jesus becoming incarnate that raises man, right? So because he's divine, because he's the son of God, his divinity is what overcomes the power of death in human nature. And when he did that, it didn't just require him like taking on a body. He also went into the realm of the dead, Hades, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, which is where he went and preached the gospel, Peter says, to the dead and thereby exposed all those people that you were saying had never heard about him to him. So we don't think that God's unfair. We think that he uh, is demonstrating his fairness by that action, according to St. Cyril. And then in the resurrection, what he does is destroy the power of death over human nature, right? The power of corruption that had been set into our nature. That doesn't mean that everybody's saved. It means that everybody's going to be resurrected. And so we don't believe in like this ethereal float away kind of mental realm. We believe that the heavens and the earth are, are recreated. So there'll be a, a return to what Eden was supposed to be all along. Uh, there will be a new heavens, a new earth. That's the return of that Edenic state, so to speak. So that's for us, the redemptive scheme, redemptive history uh, is summarized in that whole big, uh, you could call it a drama if you wanted to. Um, so it's not so much about like, uh, you know, the, the Protestant conceptions. It's more so uh, of a grand cosmic metaphysical restoration. But why would that, why would that whole thing take place? I mean, um, <laughs> I know it's kind of a crude question, but uh why would God have this plan to begin with? I mean, how is it explained that uh, you you agree with the notion that God created humans to witness his glory, right? I think that is a... a well, not just to statement. witness it, but also to experience it and to be raised into a uh, uh, what we call a state of theosis, to be deified. So God created us not to be destroyed, but to be... Uh, sons of God, as I said, and to be like Christ, right? So when Jesus is resurrected, uh, his body is freed from all of the uh, passability, decay, corruption that he willed to undergo uh, in his death. And he does that so that we can partake of that life. And that, that we, th we think is the gospel. That's why Paul says the resurrection is the gospel. So that's the purpose. Well, I have I have two issues with that. The thing is, um, sorry, the thing is that uh, one issue is so complicated that I have with that. I don't even know if I want to really go into it. Well, uh, let me let me say one last thing uh, about that because I mentioned at the beginning that one of the things I think is a really powerful testament or proof or attestation to Christianity, aside from like the philosophical arguments, would be that there's all manner of places hundreds of years, even the most liberal scholars would admit that that hundreds of these verses uh, and predictions are prior to Christ, right? Excuse me, hundreds of years. So you've, you've got, you know, J Jeremiah, uh, you've got Isaiah, you've got Hosea, you've got dozens and dozens and dozens of, of predictions. I could list Psalm 2, Psalm 8, Psalm 16, Psalm 18, Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 3, uh, Hosea 1, uh, Habakkuk 2, 14, 15, uh, uh, Ezekiel 47. I mean, I could, I've got a whole, you could, you could go through many, many more. Um, Isaiah 25, Isaiah 24, 42, Amos 9, 11, 12, uh, and, and Isaiah 49. What they're predicting is when a messianic peer, uh, figure comes, when the Messiah comes, one of the key signs they say will be that many, many, many of the Gentile nations will convert to worship the God of Israel. Now, if you think about it in the context of like people in Isaiah's day, you know, if you were a, a Jew at that time, you would have thought that's crazy, right? What? Mm -hmm. How would vast numbers of Gentiles come to worship our Hebrew God? That's, that seems crazy. Mm -hmm. 
And yet when Christ comes, the first thing that happens is that the church expands into the Roman Empire and begins to convert. And amazingly, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, all those chapters in Daniel predict that the Messiah would be born under an empire that within a few centuries would be conquered by this gospel, by this Christian message, and would become the church. It would become the kingdom of God that Daniel, Daniel says it's the kingdom of God, right? So when Jesus is going around, he keeps talking about how I'm about to set up this kingdom. I'm going to set up the kingdom of God. I'm going to draw all the nations, the, the Gentiles, to me. Mm-hmm. And so the church itself is a prophetic proof, I would say, of the fact that the Gentile nations have been brought into this prediction from centuries and centuries and millennia ago uh, that, the, that, the, that the Gentiles would come to worship the God of Israel. I mean, you can all go all the way back to Abraham, Genesis 12, 15, 17, 22. The promise to Abraham was that one of his descendants would be the person that would bring Gentile nations into covenant with the God of Israel. Well, the, the, the issue that I have with uh, this is one of many issues. Actually, I have three issues, but the issue that I want to raise right now in, in response to that is uh, you would, for example, consider all of this clear proof, uh, indication of how you think uh, this was all meant to come about. But uh, to the average Jew, for example, this would be simply dismissed as a Christian misconstruction of uh, of biblical texts in order to comfort and make it uh make well, it that, that's funny because narrative. hosea even says the jews won't believe it when it happens yeah but the thing is you know you, you can make these claims for example uh there's so by the way who, that that really doesn't have anything to do with the truth or falsity of the argument so so, the, so this is not this is not uh given a supportive argument of uh this okay this is just this is just a um, i mean there are a lot of Jews who don't believe all kinds of things. So okay, no, no, okay, I get it. Uh, what I'm saying is that what I'm saying is that uh, it is. Um, how can we how can we trust the scripture in telling us the truth? How can how can how can a random person like me read the scripture and trust it in telling us the truth when uh, the average Jew, for example, thinks, "Hey, these people just misconstrued this to make it fit their narrative." For example, there was something funny that I came across in um, in in Exodus, I believe, or uh, I, don't, I don't know wherever it, wherever it was, but um, Muslims, for example, use a specific uh, uh, Old Testament Torah uh, part to say About that that Muhammad. it's. Yeah, that it that it prophesied Muhammad. Deuteronomy, right? Yeah, that it prophesied Muhammad. Okay, yeah, Deuteronomy. Uh, the issue is that Christians use that same part uh, to say that this actually prophesied Jesus, whereas uh, Jews say no, this is, this didn't prophesy anybody. This just prophesied a future prophet, and that's all there is to it. And so, so you see that Muslims have their own interpretation by hijacking the scripture and turning it into something ridiculous, but they can do it. And people believe in that in huge numbers. Yeah, but the difference here is the continuity, right? So the, the, um, the, the Muslim uh, conception of continuity between the Old Testament prophets and, and, and Moses uh, doesn't match up at all with what's in the Quran. And ironically, the first 10 surahs of the Quran um, consistently appeal to the <laughs> law and the prophets as if they're correct, yeah. right? They even say that it's it's correct. There's, I think, three surahs that mention the fact that um, the Torah is fine, the prophets are good. I think it's uh, Surah 3, 3, 10, 37, 94, 5, 4 through 7, and 6, 1, 15 all say that the law and the prophets are correct. And then you get this other thing that Muslim apologists do where they say, oh, well, there's all these corrupted uh, texts of the Jews and the Christians. Uh, and then then they'll appeal within the very context of the text that they say are corrupted. So it's just just uh, moving the goalposts where they where they move it to wherever they oh, that proves Christianity. Well, then that's corrupted. So uh, I don't think that uh, I think that the easiest way to refute Islam in that regard is to just point out that on their own claims, they are inconsistent with the Old Testament and in, in Christianity is in fact perfectly consistent with the Old Testament. Well, you now, can say you're, that. You're, 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 you're gonna say, I know a Jew will say that it's not. Well, that's when you, you have to get into the, the text themselves to see that there's really no way around that. Well, to them there is, that's the issue. I mean, I don't, I don't- uh, No, 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 I don't, no, I'm, I don't saying, I'm saying that. that there's no way to resolve this question. Yeah, like, exactly. If you were to propose to me, how do you know that a Jew can't uh, have a better answer to your your dilemmas on the New Testament. I'm saying there's no way to do that without looking at 
the claims that are made. And, and what you'll find is that in a lot of the cases of rabbinic um, testimony, a lot of their testimonies even admit Christian positions. That's the irony here. Uh, there's a great book. I have a friend named Ken Ami, um, and he, he has a book about uh, rabbinic testimonies to uh, the validity and consistency of Christianity. And this is something that evolves over time. So you're right that, like, I'm not saying it's true just because I say that. You do have to actually get into the text, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm saying I don't, uh, I don't argue for or against any of those positions, but, uh, right. but groups among themselves obviously do. And uh, yeah, you made the point. Uh, well, the issue that I had with with this, uh, most importantly, with the whole narrative that God. Can I give you one funny example on that? Sure, sure go ahead. Um, so Daniel nine is a famous case where it has a uh, prediction of uh, the Messiah when when the Messiah is born and Jews do believe that, that a lot of these texts are messianic texts mm -hmm. they just don't think that it applies to Jesus uh, but Daniel 9 is a funny one because it's so specific and it's and it's uh, about the fact that when the Messiah does come one of the key signs will be that in his period there will be the removal of the temple <laughs> uh -huh. there will no be long, no longer a sacrifice and of course you know, 40 years after Christ's ministry, you have the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And the rabbinic testimony on that passage uh, is actually to pronounce a curse on anyone who's not a Jew that reads it. So <laughs> uh, that's one good testimony that we're actually correct on Daniel 9 is that they curse the people who read it because it's such a powerful testament to Christianity. <laughs> well, if we want to go into, uh, into you know, um, discussing specific parts of parts of the scripture and uh you know um dismissing arguments that are made based on scripture or reinterpreting scripture in order to not believe a specific narrative as a christian would claim the jews do for example i would uh i had this re i had this uh, this experience recently that i had a um a discussion in turkish with a uh, man who claims that he is a jesus he claims that he is the Messiah. He claims that he is uh, that he's Jesus reborn. That he's the Messiah. That he came to give us the good the good the good news again. That he also has his disciples by his side, who are all as they were back then uh, by his side, just with new bodies in Turkish, and all that stuff. So this guy really uh, tries to convince us that he is the Messiah. And uh, funnily enough, one of the main uh, By the way, this is the book I was looking for. My my friend who's uh, written this, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so he points out within if if anybody's interested in that topic, that is a good okay. book. Okay, okay, go ahead. Thank you. So um, he actually one of the arguments for him to claim that he's the Messiah. One of the strongest arguments that he points out is actually one of my objections that I have when I look at uh, the New Testament. I'm not saying this is uh, my major argument against Christianity. I'm no expert in Christianity, although I have uh, read about it quite a lot. And I don't base my disbelief in God uh, on Christianity, but rather on, on the idea of God itself. But, um, for example, in the New Testament, uh, it, it is pointed out, it is, I think, mentioned once or twice, uh, where Jesus is supposed to have uh, told his disciples that uh, that none of them would um, that none of them would leave or that none of them would die or that none of them would taste death uh and that the kingdom of heaven that the kingdom of god would come yes. then that relates to what i was just talking about yeah 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 and um if, if you if you read it if you read it like that as it is uh on the surface it looks like it is a false prophecy it looks like it is a it is a wrong prophecy where uh jesus literally says that 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 that, that the prophesied uh, end or future or new world kingdom of God will come before his disciples taste death. Now this, now this, uh, it came in seven in 70 AD. <laughs> so, so if you look at, I know what the text you're talking about. If mm -hmm. you look at Luke 21 and Matthew 24, especially if you read Luke 21, um, it shows that the Olivet discourse is in the context of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. In fact, he mm -hmm. says in Luke 21 that, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by enemies, know that its desolation is near. So he's referring to this abomination of desolation from Daniel. Mm -hmm. And if you think back to that period of the Maccabees, what Daniel talks about is what's in first Maccabees and Maccabees is an intertestamental defiling of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes. So this happens uh, uh, in, I think the second century BC by the Greek leader. Uh, and he sacrifices a pig on the altar 
Uh, this is a foreshadowing of what Jesus is talking about that happens 40 years later uh, that Josephus describes as the eyewitness of the destruction of the temple by Titus Vespasian. And Titus comes in and uh, defiles the temple, puts the Roman banners up, you know, basically. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So and then and then afterwards they raise the temple, they destroy it. Uh, and that's exactly what Jesus had said in Luke 21. He says, not one stone of this temple will be left up. And if you read Matthew 22, he says that this is judgment upon Israel for rejecting the Messiah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the argument there is that, that the kingdom of God, the coming of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God to, the church. to establishing. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Uh, the church. See, uh, other people uh, interpret that as, uh, as, as, as the coming of, of the, of the ends of things or as right, the resurrection oh, right so the, or, the orthodox view is that the 70 a.d the destruction of the temple because the temple is an image of this world uh -huh. the destruction of the temple is a type of the end of the world okay okay and and my uh new supposedly i am jesus guy mm -hmm. in turkish claims uh this is proof that i am jesus because jesus said that uh that none of his disciples would taste death and the kingdom of God will come. And here I am again with my disciples and the kingdom of God is coming now because now they will taste death. That's what he says. <laughs> so you can, yeah, well, you can I mean, within the Orthodox church, we have the doctrine. There's no, there's no new public revelation. So there could okay. never be a, yeah. another person mm -hmm. like that. Well, he obviously reinterprets things as he goes along, but that's just one example to reinterpreting things. But uh, actually, man, I've come a, a far away off what I was actually, uh, wanting to argue on is why would God create humanity? <clears throat> why would God create this whole system? And you, I, uh, you, we talked about it. You said, uh, you, I mean, the, the highest level of answer that we could give was just be that God wanted to communicate and share his own goodness and his own being. But wouldn't that mean that God had a beginning or that God had uh, a history that's at some point things began it's at some point the history of God began like uh, we like to describe God as this uh, eternal being who has mm -hmm. uh, no beginning and no end no time right. whatever but uh, when we look at the scripture for example we see that it says uh, in the beginning there was God mm -hmm. and then he started creating things mm -hmm. but uh, doesn't that imply that at some point things began? At some point creation began, and sure. uh, before before creation began, there was only God, and yeah. it 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 kind of uh, it kind of looks like there was a time for him at which he created something, and before that only God existed. Doesn't no, it look no, like we, we what, believe that? Yeah. Okay, doesn't it look like we are the ones who give meaning to God? It's, it looks like God has a oh, story. Uh, right. If, if I was a Muslim, that would be an argument I would make. Or, or excuse me, if you were a Muslim, that would be an argument I would make. I would say that for God to be God and Lord, he needs to be God, Lord of something, right? Mm -hmm. To be father of something, to be creator of something. Uh, and this is actually a problem, I would say, in Islamic theology, that they believe that God, that God's name of creator is synonymous with <clears throat> eternal. And some of them will even affirm that he's an eternal creator. And so he, this kind of falls into a dilemma that's in Aristotle. Um, to where the definition or explication of who God is is dependent upon him being Lord, creator, uh, mover, actualizer of something other than himself. And that would be creation in most schemes. So anybody who has a, quote, strict um, Unitarian uh, uh, monotheism will have that dilemma and that problem. But that's one of the reasons that we believe in the Trinity uh, is that we don't think that God's um, expression of his own uh, self-existence and love and communication of attributes and glory and so forth is dependent on creation because it's shared amongst the persons of the Trinity. But what does it, um, how, do, how does it solve the problem? I don't understand how it solves the problem of Because of God. God's not dependent on creation to exercise his love and communion. Sure, he's not, but... Um... My point would not be that he uh, is dependent on it, but rather that uh, he created us at some point, which means that uh, it basically looks like that is when God became relevant. And before that, God only existed by himself and God only existed in, in nothingness. And uh, be, I mean, no, but before... it's, not, it's not nothingness or, or uh, irrelevance. It's a triune God, Father, Son and Spirit with perfect unity and perfect communication of love. Uh, and communion. So oh, wow. okay. for us, that's the highest level of reality that conditions and gives meaning to our reality. So it's man is who is becoming relevant, not God. Okay. Um, 
that that just uh, that fe that feels like a very arrogant thing to believe of, of humans that um it looks like we are the ultimate uh meaning of the universe the ultimate meaning of everything the, the focus of of god the focus of everything but we in are the, in the because, world. but we are because god is become man that's the only reason that we are what we are so it's it's not arrogant because if if god wills it to be that way mm -hmm. and god did that because he wanted to because he desired it because he felt the the desire the will yeah, to out, be. Of, out of his own um overflowing goodness he willed to become man so that we could experience god and be like god but if it is about if it is about his his goodness then why did he create a system in which we need to be uh raised and purified in order to be part of his goodness and otherwise we are uh yeah. left out and punished so there, right there's different um possible answers that you could give to that question um i i think you could uh, potentially argue uh, a liveness type of argument that um the best type of universe would be the universe where uh more of god's attributes are displayed because we we don't just think that it's a thing that we see about god you actually participate in god we believe that's our belief uh, and so a situation where god displays more of his attributes such as his mercy and forgiveness that's better than a universe where there was basically just robots or automatons and so forth. So God, uh, in his infinite wisdom, knew that a universe where there's free will in the long run and the omniscient scheme that he knows is better than a universe where there was not free will. That's the best answer that we could give. Um, but he could have eventually created. I mean, uh, isn't the premise that um, so we have free will and because we have free will, we are unable to to do evil, to commit evil, which is why we have to be uh, sorted out and punished for that evil. Well, uh, wait, wait, say that again? What now? So we have to, um, fr a world with free will is the best possible thing. And if we have free will, then we also have to have evil. Evil also has to exist. Oh, I say, Where no, that we don't believe that. So we make a different a distinction between um, free will in the sense of the ability to choose or will multiple goods distinct mm -hmm. goods as opposed to what we characterize as the post fall notion of free will which is a choice between good and evil so uh, we think that in the eschaton there will no longer be a choice of evil but there will be multiple goods to have so there will still be free will because you can still choose multiple goods but that's a kind of an obtuse <clears throat> arena but this is actually an area where we disagree with western uh, theology in uh, roman catholic theology this is known as the beatific vision which we we don't believe that Okay, the question would remain that. Um, so, so the question was uh, to to go to go back to the to the question is uh, so God creates us to to witness or to to live to experience His glory to experience Him. Right. Uh, he creates us into this world. He creates us uh, with free will. Uh, the fall happens, but the fall is supposed to happen as part of the plan, right? So it is part of the plan that something goes wrong, that evil occurs, and that we. Uh, no, thereafter I'm, are so so god permitting something is not the same thing as god intentionally causing something so uh no, i'm not i would not say that uh it was part of the plan for man to fall uh, because i was saying that we believe that that man is patterned on christ being incarnate we're made in the image of christ mm -hmm. so we think that it was always the the case that christ was going to become incarnate even if man had not fallen that leaves us with uh, thinking God did create us without creating a punishment for us, but we exist because uh, because we are told or taught that a fall happened, which we know from Scripture, which is why we live the which is why we live our lives uh, right now in ignorance and evil, and could eventually misuse our free will and end up in hell forever. But uh, and, and you're saying just because God permitted that to happen, that doesn't mean that God uh, cr that God intended that to happen or God uh, made that happen. No, I said but, there's a distinction between God permitting something and Him actively causing something. Okay, but if He permits that, I mean, isn't that supposed to be part of God's plan? Isn't that supposed to be uh, a God creates everything and He knows that the fall will happen or it is such a big thing such a big event that it completely disrupts the entire system that it disrupts everything that is going on disrupts the entire plan and suddenly we are left to decide between good and evil and eventually suffer forever if we choose evil unknowingly 
And so I see. So you're trying to make an argument about uh, the problem of evil and why would there be a problem of evil at all if mm -hmm. God knew all along that there would be the existence of yeah. evil and therefore it's not consistent that we would be punished for that. But again, this is ignoring the fact that that why can't God set up a world where there is free will? Like what's inconsistent about that? Why would he need to create evil for that to happen? He could simply create a world where free will it's exists. Not creating evil, it's it's permitting evil. It that, that is just that is just one way of saying creating because uh, no, he, this is a this is actually a big debate in the history of a lot of different philosophies and religions as to whether evil has some kind of existence or not. We I'm don't sure think that it does. So for again for us, it, God creating men with the ability to will to move away from Him or angels to move away from Him. Uh, is we don't know the ultimate reason why other than that he did and he did it for a good reason and the best speculation that we could come up with is that that's a universe where we do see the explication of or, or the, the manifestation i should say of more of god's attributes than a universe where he didn't allow those things right so a universe where he does punish evil manifests his justice and his mercy and his forgiveness uh, a universe we, where he do, where he doesn't and that's not inconsistent let, hear me out on this it's not inconsistent within the christian paradigm because god is the highest good and so if he's displaying and allowing the participation in more of his attributes than a universe where he doesn't that's not inconsistent okay but um According to your belief, according to the to the general belief, after we uh, after this is over and after we are resurrected, after we are uh, we are where we are meant to be, uh, and we go to heaven, we will still have free will, right? Yes. Will we then be able to commit evil and to be no? Because be free will is not primarily a choice between good and evil, but a choice between multiple goods. That means that God could have created a world in which free will can exist, but we can also not make the choice to commit evil and to go to hell. right so for example in the garden of eden before the fall adam and eve had free will they still had free will before there was the uh introduction of evil so they were choosing different things they still had we believe they still had free will then when adam sinned he chose evil willfully we would say and now that there's the introduction of a new state of affairs to where in our view the fall affected all of reality not just man in terms of death but death decay and corruption and everything plant life right the world as a whole all of the universe is metaphysically affected we believe by the fall so now we're in a situation where typically speaking when we say free will we mean a choice between good and evil um, but even in this even in this life there's still the ability to choose between multiple goods uh, and then in the eschaton there will not be the choice of evil there will be the return to the, the state prior uh the pre-lapsarian state i should say so um I don't see how we can solve this, but I want to um, just to make this just to. Okay, but but I mean, you're saying solve it, but like you're asking for what a question of of. <laughs> okay, like, let me get to it. Let me get to it. Okay. Uh, uh, just a second. Don't be afraid. I'm gonna, but... I'm, I'm gonna have to go pretty soon, but we can we can go a little bit more. Yeah, I should probably end this soon too. But okay, just one one one. Yeah, we one can do another one too if you want to do another part two. I actually I actually love this. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we great. can set up a part two. Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, so, so one final thing. I just want to uh, illustrate this. I, I want to put myself in the position of uh, a creator. Don't be offended by this, anybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I, I am, I am this magic. I am this master uh, of everything. This powerful, eternally powerful being, uh, more powerful than anything there is. And I have the ability to create whatever I want. I decide. Hey, it would be great if I create these uh, beings, these sensitive beings that can feel, that can reason, that have flaws, that have goodness and all of that. Uh, because I want them to be something good. I want some someone else to experience all this beauty. So I create them. And as I, as I create them, and as I create every single individual, every, as I create this whole uh, mankind, I think to myself, I should create these people or these things, these beings with the ability to make their own choices, because that way everything will, will be much better for them. Now, I can think of this and I can think if I give them the ability to have free will and to make their own choices, then I see they will eventually come to a point where they will make a giant mistake, a giant mess up. And uh, thereafter, millions billions of them will have a 
corrupt sort of free will, where if they choose evil, they will eventually uh, go to hell. I will eventually punish them with hell for making that wrong choice mm -hmm. in the system where I created them. But that's only because they themselves chose evil in this system which I created. Mm -hmm. And then, and I think to myself, should I create them or not? So there, there are two options here. I could simply fix that problem, or I could just go ahead and create them, uh, knowing that uh, that, that that generations, billions of people will come forth, that will all suffer because a glitch happened or a, or a mistake happened in the system which I created. If you were in that position, if I was not in that position, I would not create those people. I would fix the problem and then create those people. And I think that is pretty pretty consistent with uh, how Christianity teaches me to act in the world, in life, for example. If you were in that position, would you go ahead and create those people or would you fix that problem first? Yeah, no, I understand the objection. So you're, it's a variation on the problem of uh, evil theodicy. And you're saying that why, would, why wouldn't God have done it a different way in the beginning? And uh, all I can say is that what I said earlier is that we're not told the ultimate reason for why God did permit evil. Um, That's but, right. but God's not under an obligation to tell us why he did X, Y, Z. So this is the whole, the whole uh, dilemma of the book of Job, right? Job mm -hmm. says, I mean, is it really fair for you to admit all this stuff? And God basically says, you're a finite being. How could I even explain to you all of the different interrelations between all the different created causes? So if you can't even know the created causation within the natural world, how do you expect to know all of this stuff that's operating at like a higher, uh, you know, spiritual realm? Now, here's the final dilemma. Um, if I if I look at that argument and if I think that, uh, that this simply doesn't make sense and that I can, for this reason, not believe in God, because to me, from what I have learned, from what I see, this is uh, evil, this is not good, which is why I cannot believe in this. Even if you think I have no basis to believe in that, even if you think I'm wrong in believing that because I cannot justify why I call it evil. But if I now really think to myself, I cannot believe in this, this doesn't make sense to me because this doesn't seem good, it seems evil. And I die and God judges me for that, for making that mistake, for thinking this is evil, I cannot believe in evil, I can only believe in good. And he will judge me and I will go to hell forever and burn. It's, I simply cannot solve that dilemma. <laughs> and I know you will say we, that's not something that we have any right or any position or any power to understand. I get it, but this is a dilemma. But so first of all, uh, the, if we if if every position has a, a dilemma in the sense of uh, finitude limiting our grasp, so what what position escapes this kind of a dilemma? And if you're fine with there being no position that escapes this kind of dilemma, then on what basis are we saying that Christianity has to answer? A dilemma that pretty much can't be answered by anyone finite. I don't think Christianity has to answer it. I just think that Christianity cannot answer this specific dilemma, that this dilemma exists. And uh, if I am confronted with uh, with the dilemma that uh, I cannot believe in this specific teaching, in this specific doctrine, because it doesn't, simply doesn't make sense to me and doesn't seem good to me, this is this is simply a problem. I mean, that's 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 okay. all there is but to how it. Do you, okay, how do you know that you have the right notion I don't. of what makes I don't. sense. I don't. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong in my conclusion. Whether I'm right or wrong doesn't even matter. What matters is that I can be right and I can be wrong in this. I can be, I can't, maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe I have completely made the false conclusion, but I have, I have, I have looked for it. I have uh, gone on a journey and I've really looked for the truth, really looked for goodness. And I came to a conclusion and maybe that conclusion is wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but I did come to that conclusion in the end, and because I'm able to, with no bad intention at all. Okay, but the ability to come to those conclusions rests on <clears throat> prior things, like standards, that only make sense in a certain kind of world. And if the world that you're talking about is true, then there aren't any objective standards, as you've said. And so that really there's not a basis to say that it makes sense. It doesn't, yeah, that's true. And we can talk about that lengthily, but um, 
this would just simply mean that uh, that I think Christianity in its truth claim eventually is inconsistent. With okay, but, but that dilemma is not avoided in any worldview. So it's almost it's almost like it's almost like saying maybe it's not meant to be. It's almost like if what if I said uh, I want an uh, the the perfect infinite algorithm, and unless you give it to me, I will not believe in your argument. <clears throat> so basically, you've weighted the the demand with something that can't be given, and then you're saying that well, since that can't be given. Uh, I can't affirm or believe that your argument is sound or your position is sound, but it's almost like a, it's, that's like an, it's a, and it's impossible order. It's a, it's, nobody can do that. So if that's the strictures that we're going to have for why we should or shouldn't believe a paradigm or a worldview, then we shouldn't believe any paradigm or worldview. I mean, well, the, the issue is my conclusion could either be that, uh, that God definitely does not exist or that God or that Christianity is definitely not. That's not, not a valid true. conclusion from that question. That's my point. No, I, I, I question I know, I know. can't tell you that. I know, I know. That's what I'm saying. I could either go ahead and say uh, God doesn't exist, or God, or, or Christianity is not true based on this, or I could say I don't really think God exists, or I don't really think Christianity is true because it has this problem, which it doesn't seem to answer. So what I'm I making, understand what I'm the making, argument, but I'm saying that how do you get to that conclusion from that argument if that argument is almost an impossibly tall order for any position? Well, we don't need what, what if I said this? What if I said this? What if I said you have to show me infinity or I will not believe in infinity? Like you could say, well, here's a mathematical number eight on its side. Oh, that represents infinity. That's not infinity. So I've, I've given you this like the, this challenge that you that nobody can. You can't demonstrate show somebody. infinity. You can show like symbols that represent <laughs> it. And it's a mathematical concept that we kind of all acknowledge, but we don't actually have like a visual, uh, oh, I see infinity, right? So it would, it would almost be like an impossible question. And I, I don't think that you could say, well, therefore I will not and don't have any reason to believe infinity because you haven't shown it to me. I don't think that's, I don't think that's the same thing. I generally don't how understand. Is it, how whether... is it not? It's a, it's a, <laughs> I think it's a perfect analogy for that. I, I generally... No, I generally don't, don't understand how that is the same thing. I really don't understand how that is the same thing. It's, I'm not saying... So because you're setting up a question that no worldview could give, and then you're saying, it, because you can't give that, I don't have to believe your position. No, it's, I, don't, I don't think uh, that that is a standard or a condition that needs to exist in the world. I'm simply saying that uh, Christianity in itself... Is not consistent in that truth claim. I don't. I don't look for that. I don't look for the solution of that problem in the real world. I can, for example, believe that uh, that we exist no, in a world so that is that is universally unfair. If I mean, you seem to admit earlier that God isn't under any obligation to tell us why He permitted something. Of course, it's so simply, is, no. It, it just so it just how is it inconsistent. It just it just doesn't make sense. I'm not. I'm not no, saying how. I know you're saying it doesn't. How. I'm saying it does not make sense that God would uh, create such a system in which good and evil exists when he could have simply gone ahead with something different and then judge me based on my, uh, in my natural inability to make the right judgment, which exists in all of us, which exists in half of humankind, which is bound to exist in all of us. It simply internally doesn't make sense. It's internally inconsistent. If, if, if God is good, if God is uh, all knowing, if God is, you know, the, 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 the best thing in the world, the, 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 the epitome of goodness, then that should not be a problem to God. Okay, but as I said earlier, it, I, I would I don't I don't say this is I don't say this is uh, an ultimate uh, an ultimate argument which completely disqualifies God and religion. I'm simply saying this is a problem which doesn't make it seem like this is the truth. Okay, but it's it's a I understand the argument that you're making and I understand that you see it as an inconsistency. And all I'm saying is that within the Christian paradigm, it's not an inconsistency. Because there might be things that we don't get, sure. that we don't grasp. God but doesn't if, have to if, do that. No, he doesn't have to tell us every reason for why he does X, Y, Z. That's true. That's true. God doesn't have to. And, and why is that? Well, as I said earlier, because of our finitude and God's infinity, there's always going to be limitations in what we know or describe or understand about God. And so, therefore, there's always a, a limit 
And that's why I made the analogy to infinity. It's like saying, unless you can resolve exhaustively any area of the unknown, I won't believe the position. And I'm saying that I don't think that's a good argument because. Well, well that would basically, that's basically saying. Uh, you're asking why did God do something that he purposed to do from all eternity when he could have done something else? No. And I'm saying that we're not told that. I know. Uh, so the only response that we have left is to say, well, we don't know. And God knows what he does. Well, I also said that the, the highest speculation that we could give is that the best universe is one in which more of God's attributes are displayed as opposed to a universe where they're not. So if there's a universe where there's no fall, then we don't see God's justice, God's mercy and God's forgiveness. So these are attributes that display more of his goodness as opposed to a universe where he does not display those. I would argue that um, it doesn't. We doesn't. We don't need to exist in a, in a in a universe where we have to, where where the fall can exist, and where we have to, where where we have to be able to make mistakes in order to uh, to to observe the uh, all qualities or uh, all the goodness of God. We could no, simply exist in the Christian God paradigm. Exists. God is the highest good, and so the more that we know and see of God, the better that universe is. That's what I'm saying. But we could have known that without being <laughs> thrown into the fire for that. Huh? Well, uh, not everybody will be thrown into the fire, so to speak. By the way, we have a different conception of the eschaton. It's not a lake of fire but, in the sense of lava. It means that you experience the eschaton that you've chosen. Okay, well, let me say thrown. Under, let me say thrown under the bus. Then I was just being uh, metaphorical. So no, but uh, it's not throwing you under it. It's your decision that you made unknowingly. Because no, I not am... unknowingly. I've spent the whole time telling you that. Well, <laughs> that, that I. We believe that everybody is knowingly making decisions. Of course, but the thing is, see, you are sitting with me here. We have been for for almost three hours, two and a half hours. You have been trying to convince me with arguments, and uh, well, I made one argument that was pretty strong, where I was showing a contradiction, and I think that's a pretty strong argument. No, <laughs> of course, I, n n uh, nothing against your arguments. I think I think uh, it's pretty good discussing with you, but the the issue is the issue is that we are sitting here discussing lengthily and. Uh, one person may maybe may sit here and think, "Oh, that's a very good argument. I will now believe." While another person may sit here and be like, "Okay, I'm not convinced." By okay, that. but that doesn't have to do with which I know, one. I know, but, but simply, or... but simply the fact that we are sitting here that you are trying to convince me, and that so many people out there will never be convinced by 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 arguments, uh, simply shows that people do not know that 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 you think we know inside, or that we are taught we know deep inside, but that we many of us end up not knowing and not believing, genuinely not knowing. I do not accept the the the, the premise, the accusation that it is me who chooses not to know. I know for a fact that I'm trying my best to know, but I simply do not know if that is the truth. And if I make a mistake in the end, then I make that mistake because I'm able to make that mistake because I'm I, because I have a flawed mind which God created. That's well, I'll tell you what I'm, I'm going to have to go because we're okay, okay, sure. three yeah, hours. We're... But uh, why don't we set up a part two and then we can list some more mm -hmm. uh, challenge questions? How's that? Uh, sure, sure, we can do that. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great chat. Me, yeah, me too, me too. I got a little bit uh, confused when when uh, it's, it's at one point, but I think it was a very fruitful conversation. I really enjoyed Absolutely. it. Yeah, no, it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that's it. I think we've spent so much time. Uh, I will let Jay go. Maybe I can look into the super chats here and respond to them uh, quickly. Uh, but uh, we'll meet again. Jay, is there anything? Are you there? Uh, if you have, like, do you have specific super chats that were directed at me? I don't want to leave. If there were some that wanted to ask me something. Let me see. Uh, Hindu historian, Hindu historian, super sticker. Hi, thanks for this interesting discussion. Question, look, and you shall find, ask, and you shall receive. How is this not the way New Age calls the rule of attraction? Asked by Hugh J. Rection. <laughs> uh, P said, kindly elucidate on Florovsky's return to the fathers, compared and contrasted with the argument from authority fallacy. Thanks. Likes and subscribers be upon our grant move to AP. Thank you. Uh, anything you want to address in that? Or? What was the question? Kindly elucidate on Florovsky's. It wasn't the question, rather. Florovsky's return to the fathers, compared and contrasted with the argument from authority fallacy. Thanks. That's. It was just a recommendation. Uh, maybe we can keep that stuff for next time. Okay. Milek eighty three said, "Ridvan, kannst du dich bei mir melden?" In German. Uh, 
Okay, I will get in touch with you, Malik83. Send me an email, theapostateprofit at gmail.com. Uh, Rips exposed me to Super Chat and said, I feel like this is the conversation you should have had with David Wood, but you know, interesting conversation anyway. Well, I appreciate it. I will probably have it with him too. Uh, Tanner Terry said in a Super Chat, AP, when you say morality is formed by humans figuring out what works, that is not a complete thought. What does it work for? Yeah, we went into a lengthy discussion on that one. The Lost One said, divine revelation is not consistent. That's my problem with it. Tanner Terry said, AP, you said it is the case that there cannot be an objective basis for morality. This itself is a claim about how morality exists and would be an objective basis for how morality exists in the world. This is self-refuting. Yeah, we went into a deep thing there. Uh, let me direct something at you if there's something for you. Otherwise, I will let you go. And um, Okay. Wait, how is it possible to communicate current knowledge? Momo Sodawa running away from Jay Dyer. SC Dawa running away from Jay Dyer. Oh, by the way, I wanted to tell you, um, back when you were talking with uh, Hijab, I issued a challenge to Muhammad Hijab in that thread. Uh, it got 500 likes, 150 retweets, and he completely ignored it. So I don't think Muhammad Hijab wants to have a debate with me either. <laughs> but I will I will lay this out there if he watches this and he does want to have a debate. We can. Yeah, he, uh, Muhammad Hijab, if you want to accept the debate, accept it. What, what did you want to debate with him? What's the topic? Well, I'm sure we would debate the Quran and Jesus and his d deity and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think um, Muhammad Hijab has this thing. He will agree to debates if he can, um, if he can attack an opposing belief or worldview. If he can, for example, um, you know, criticize Christianity or criticize atheism, he will agree to that debate if you push him. But he will not agree to a debate in which he has to actually defend Islam. Yeah, you, I've heard that. Yeah, 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 yeah. He runs from that like crazy. You should you should challenge him on Islam too after you're done with your Quran study. Um, Jay made Shabir cry. Imagine what he'd do to Muhammad Hijab. By the way, we should talk about your debate with uh, Shabir Ali sometime. I haven't had the opportunity to completely uh, watch it through, but we could definitely talk yeah. about that here. Great guest and stream AP. Next time you have Jay on, could the two of you review Jay's debate with Shabir Ali? <laughs> and go. the transcendental argument that was applied. Thanks, dear Juju. <laughs> this is Nataverse. Thank you, Nataverse, by the way, for arranging this. And here is one for you, actually. Jay, uh, Yahweh, was it Yahweh's Eiler? Jay, do you as an Orthodox believe only the Orthodox will be saved and not other Christians? If yes, why? Uh, P.S. Your logic is brilliant. Well, so ultimately, yes, a person has to be um, joined to Christ and to the Orthodox Church uh, by whatever means. So if God chooses to or makes a means to do that, as we were talking about earlier uh, with those who somehow died and had not heard this, if there's an extraordinary way by which he preaches the gospel to them, uh, we would say that's a possibility. If he's, if he's operated on that principle in the past, it's conceivable that he would do that in the future. But however he does that, it really can't occur without a person being in some way joined to the Orthodox Church, yes. Okay. I was curious about that too. Uh, Tanner Terry said, Jay, if the afterlife is a choice between multiple goods like Adam and Eve pre-fall, then could there be another fall? If not, why not? I no, because, be because uh, the purpose of Christ's resurrection, St. Maximus argues, is to remove that uh, possibility and that that uh the annoia. so we don't have like the same type of discursive reasoning that would lead us to make mistakes or fall into sin in the eschaton because that's been healed and restored that's one of the purposes of the resurrection see there i would again say couldn't that have been the case beforehand but then, then we would get into this endless cycle again but uh I will let you go if you, if you need to go and I'll yeah well let's 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 uh let's do that again in the future Okay, okay, we can do that. All right, thanks uh, for having me, man. I appreciate it. It was a great chat. Thank you so much for joining me, Jay. I, I really time. appreciate it. Yeah. All right, have a good night. Thank you, too. All right. All right, everybody. That was uh, interesting. This was, um, man, it was fruitful. <laughs> I liked it. I would actually like to have this conversation again with Jay, also in the future with with others, with other uh, Christians, Christian apologists. I would love to have it with Muslims, but pff, see, Muslims just don't like me for some reason. I have no idea why. Uh, but yeah, I, I I really appreciated this. I didn't want to have a debate deliberately because I th um, actually I, I I would maybe have a debate with 
uh, somebody else. I recently spoke with uh, Inspiring Philosophy, and um, we agreed that we could sit down and have a have a debate, an actual debate about the whole God question. And in that debate, we would um, it would be moderated by uh, Cameron Bertuzzi, capturing Christianity. Uh, we would have uh, you know opening statements, timed statements, and all that. Uh, I don't know if that will happen, but I really actually uh, like these uh, free conversations that we have. I really enjoy that. It's, it takes away the whole edge of, <clears throat> of hey, I'm, I am right. I will prove you wrong. I will destroy you. I am the right one. The whole uh, arrogance and the whole edge of that, it takes it away. And it really um, leaves the confrontation to a proper, peaceful uh exchange of ideas inquiry of of truth where we actually listen to each other and respond when we think it is time to respond so yeah i like this i will have this uh again and thanks so much Nadevers, for arranging this i will quickly uh read through all those super chats that i have missed um and then i will hopefully leave because it's way too late for me here. Hindu story made a super chat and said, hi, Hindu story made a super sticker too, which I cannot see because I have it on my smaller screen here. Let me drag this out. I just did out like a Canadian. How is it going? Okay, I see it now. Um, Rips exposed. Tanner Terry said, AP, when you say morality is formed by humans figuring out what works, that is not a complete thought. What does it work for? Pragmatism has said, um, man, I should make a, I should make a whole monologue about that uh but we can just i i would love to debate that with david wood actually because we were supposed to have a morality debate the lost one said uh divine revelation is not consistent that's my problem with it that's a whole topic that i didn't actually want to bring up it would be too complicated i would say but yeah worth a discussion too china terry said to both what is the nature of man given this view of man how is it possible that humans can acquire knowledge uh you want to discuss evolution against creation <laughs> uh i'm currently studying psychology i will tell you more in the future sophia films made a super chat and said at least this isn't a, a shout fest thanks for decency thank you i really appreciate that too this is all it should be really Sophia Film said Momo and SC Dawa are running away from Jay Dyer. If Momo and Shabiri the best Islam has, then Islam is done. <laughs> uh, I'm preparing at the end of Muhammad Hijab, by the way. It will uh, hopefully be done within the next few. I, I won't give it away. I, I keep getting sick of it and sitting down and thinking, why am I dealing with this nonsense? But yeah, it will be there soon. Sophia Films also said, join and fight the Antichrist with us in all its forms. Maybe we can agree that Islam is the Antichrist. How about that? 12BKL, my shoe, said, the question which monotheistic God is a true God is the main conflict of the world's largest religions. How is this different than polytheists? You see, if we came to the conclusion that, uh, that, 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 that the monotheist God actually exists, that there is actually indeed a monotheistic God, I hate the word actually, and I have said it so many times, uh, that there is indeed a monotheistic God, then I would really go into finding out which religion tells us the truth about this monotheistic God. And we don't really have many options there. We have uh, Judaism, we have Christianity, and we have uh, Islam. It, it, it looks like logically, I would com completely dismiss Islam. I believe to 100% that it is absolutely false in its truth claim. It would leave me with Christianity. But Christianity is also theologically, I don't, th I, I think it is flawed, inconsistent, and maybe we can discuss that next time. But uh, again, the problem is the question of the monotheistic God or God in and of itself, not whether uh, which one gives us, not which one gives us the right answer on this specific God. Sophia Films said, my brain feels, feels like soup right now so uh sorry for making um for speaking incomplete or incoherent sentences <laughs> sophia film said come to christ ex-muslims he's the truth and the way sophia films also said you made so many super chats i appreciate that sophia films uh turkey was christian anatolia revert to christ ap and uh sophia films also said well i am probably a descendant of barbaric savage 
tribes from uh, East Asia that wanted to invade the world. So I cannot take credit for the whole Christian part, but I get your point. Sophia film says, uh, Jay Dyer makes Tucker Carlson's about to slay faces. <laughs> Yahweh's Eiler, I read that question to Jay. Spotlight official said, remove religion from the conversation, then ask, God, does God exist? Also, one thing that I wanted to go into, maybe maybe um, we can talk about that next time. But I think Jay basically was arguing that um, he has reason to believe that God exists. And... Um, he has solid reason to 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 believe that it is only the christian narrative that is telling us the truth and we have only begun to dig into that hmm josh arno said i don't always make super chats but when i do i prefer you two guys debating thank you so much i appreciate that uh, and solitary amy said um ap do you like what being a christian is about what if you start with faith and then search more after you take the first step grow in faith doing that would make me um would create a bias in me which would then push me toward believing in something uh without knowing whether i'm actually believing in the right thing or not which is why to me the only reasonable and uh honest way internally honest way to believe in something is to first make sure that you believe in it first make first conclude that it actually makes sense that it is logical that it is uh yeah that it's that it's true and then to start following it if i just followed something because i think it is it is nice or it is good then i would be fooling myself i would i would kind of be a hypocrite right yeah I also don't agree completely with uh, the Christian sense of morality. Uh, I'm really, I'm really happy uh, thinking freely and having no limits to what I can and cannot think about and conclude. But thank you. And Joshua Schmidt made a super chat finally and said, "Living a Christian life is a better witness than arguments." Jay is a good example of this, as even though he made many arguments, he was polite and, de and decent, opening the door for more converts. Mm -hmm. That I would say is not a good argument because <laughs> you would agree, you would you could argue that there are many terrible Christians, there are many good Muslims, many terrible Muslims, many good Christians, many terrible atheists, many good atheists. Most of the atheists that I have encountered throughout my life were very good people that I could trust. So you cannot really judge something based on that based on the experiences of people that you see but uh yeah that's my two cents to that anyway i will be leaving um and that is all that i want to say for tonight thanks everybody for joining i'm not an agnostic i'm an i'm i'm an agnostic atheist i can maybe explain that some other time um yeah, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a fantastic day. And as always, see you next time and stay away from Islam.